Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. Wherever you may be in a world plagued by pandemics, protests, perverts, police brutality, and piss poor pro wrestling, we're so glad you could attend so we can all have this bitch fest together. If they have to make us grumpy, we're going to have fun being grumpy today on the program, ladies and gentlemen. And do join me, my cohort and co host, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting line, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co host to you, Swammy's Pappy. He's the man of the hour, the towel power, too sweet to be thou, a 200 pound of twisted steel, as sex appeal, sweet loving, hugging, squeezing, pleasing, baby blue eyed soul, your friend and mine. The great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. You could have gone a couple of different roads with that. You could have gone Billy Graham. You went full Dusty Roads, right there. I wanted you to get funky like a monkey. Can you do a Billy Graham? It, you know, Billy Graham is so because he's. It's more of a tonal quality. Yeah. He had the jive, you know, like Dusty did. He had the the jive and the old preacher stuff and the, and the gospel, but at the same time, he had then. And then nasal delivery and push it out a little bit where it just seemed like it, you know. There's a little I, Bob I Dylan in there with the nasal. A little Bob Dylan. Yes. Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon put me on steroids. Vince McMahon <laughs> told me my wife would shoot him if she could. It's, it's not exactly good, but it's tonal in quality. Like it's, well, what if we mixed up Billy Graham and Bob Dylan? Once upon a time, Vince dressed so fine. Do the month of time, in time. <laughs> Didn't he? But then he got old, and then he couldn't get up out of the chair. Can't he? I don't know. All right, this is just what the fuck. Neither Billy Graham nor Bob Dylan is on the program today. But you are uh, you are joining us, ladies and gentlemen. As I think that's what we ought to do. Is we if if everything in the world is going to piss us off, then we should have fun being grumpy together because like we're the voice of the soulless here, right? The people with no souls that didn't like football field fuckery and Jericho sucked out all our souls. So we're the voice of the soulless, much like I said, Heyman, that time when it was, I said he was the voice of the homeless. <laughs> um, he is we once are, again. We, <laughs> well, he was one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed McMahon, you're not supposed to fucking hit Carson with one like that so early. Uh, yes, you've stolen the show, but it was petty theft. Uh, you're the voice of the homeless, and we are the voice of the soulless, and we are also the voice of the grumpy. Because people that don't listen to that, they listen to select of our, I guess, our YouTube clips just so that they can have something to be grumpy at me over and mad at me about. But they'll tweet, why are you always so mad? Why are you always so hostile why are you always so angry but the the people who listen to this program on a regular basis know i think that nobody and i brian i think you can concur with this nobody has more fun being pissed off than i do nobody has more fun with the various things and people that make him fucking grumpy that and that's what we've got to do because there's nothing in the world now that shouldn't be making us grumpy, so we have to have some fun with it. I can verify you take great delight <laughs> in being grumpy about these things. Well, you know, and and that's because, and especially after some of the wrestling I've watched lately, yeah, yes, we're going to talk about backlash. It actually, it, it should be named backwash. That's when you fucking try to take a desperate breath in while you're puking, and you suck some of the vomit back down and throw it up again backwash the paper part of the pay-per-view the 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 pertinent parts as they say we're going to talk about that and of course they had an actual wrestling match broke out on uh all petite wrestling last week and we'll or this past week we'll talk about that but <clears throat> um it, it, i guess we ought to tell the story straight up at the top of the program and get it out of the way of how we were joking around last week about blowing up my website and we fucking blew up my website and now it ain't so funny yeah. i d i do apologize and i blame myself for all the people who say cornet never takes fucking responsibility blame somebody else for everything well no i blame my me myself and i all three of us because at the top of the the episode here i will say that last christmas 
after the onslaught there, I was saying, Brian, we got to get a new website. There's too much traffic. It's, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, nothing has ever slowed down. Things have speeded up and I've never had time to sit and focus and, and put the thing in motion. We have done that. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I blame myself. But before we've had problems in various, we didn't ever just fry the whole goddamn thing before like this. And I'm not sure. I said the the action figures, and by the way, ladies, they are sold out. Um, I said they were going to go on sale Monday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. And I like to be punctual. So I went to Stacy, who was the on-site operations manager of this fucking technological miracle. And I said, go ahead and put figures up in five minutes. And she gets on the day and she says, sights down. What? And just then her phone, she starts getting texts from people of, of who would be texting her about a thing like this. Sights crashed. And all we can see is the no error message. Uh, uh, she starts calling all the service providers. I don't know what they do, what service they provide, but she's calling them all. And a, a senior member of the cult who's going to be assisting me with the new operation. I won't mention his name here. He might not want to be attached to this project publicly just yet. Uh, is, is, is she's on the, the phone with him. And <clears throat> so basically there's a saying that we've, there was so many people that tried to get on at the same time, apparently because I was stupid and, and, and issued an exact moment that it just, it crashed the thing. The server exceeded capacity, as they say. And so, but, but, and nobody on the phone is any help. Otherwise, well, you need a bigger server or whatever. Um, but finally, it could, you know, somebody, they get it back up about 9.50. And it, it's things are, we can't even get in the back end of it at one point when people are on online ordering shit. She, she got, she got up and she got the figure in and then it went down again. And then she's trying to get back on it. So we can't get on our own website that people are buying the figures from, but that's restored. And then the bring, ding, 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 ding. And I'm trying to keep track. And of course it's fried the inventory gimmick because I said, how many of these we got left? And she gave me the number. I said, that can't be right. Cause we've had way more orders. So I'm trying to keep up with this manually and count these things. They come in. And as, as I'm, I'm thinking I'd need to cut it off. And then I'm realizing shit. I think we've oversold. I'm on the phone with figures toy company. And as I mentioned, they have had some on sale for their vendors and their website, but they started with half as many as I had and they've sold some. So I wangled another 40 out of them. Again, it turns out when I did the final count, good. Cause I oversold like 10 or 12. And as for the rest of them, I'm sitting on these because I'm not going to advertise. They're going to be on sale anytime in the near future and blow myself up again. But uh, there are some people whose carts crashed and didn't get in on it. I'm trying to take care of, but anyway, by the time I get all that counted and we take them down, they sold in like an hour and 15 minutes. We take that down and the site goes down again because now something, so many people have been in the store. Apparently this is a record num number that it fried some of the code. You can tell I'm talking about the fucking space shuttle here. Can't you, you? have no idea what you're talking no, I got about. No, <laughs> So, so then the, it would, the site was down again. Error kid does not compute danger. Will Robinson danger, danger. And I say, you know what? We can get a hold of the guy that, that, that built this, this, uh, this fine operation and, and he can fix it, but I don't give a fuck. I'm going to go out and sit under the tree. So the site was down for the rest of the day. Well, I went and sat under the tree and then began the process of, of filling the rest of the folks fine orders that had come in before Monday. Um, and by the way, just an update, if you've spent money with me, everything ordered through June the 3rd is in the mail or has already arrived. Everything ordered from June the 3rd through June the 14th will be out by Monday, June 22nd, except possibly for a few of those pesky internationals that may follow the day after. And the figures start going out on Wednesday, June 24th. Uh, so that's your update there. 
this has been the oddest marketing strategy. Now, we go for a couple of months. We don't mention the website by name, and we don't talk about any of the products specifically, and I can't keep up with it. And then we actually mention the website and announce a specific product on two podcasts, and it fries my shit. I don't. I didn't intend it to be this way, but we have we've fallen on a great strategy here. But 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 it, but, but then again, if you think about it, if that's the case, if total lack of publicity and complete ignorance that something exists made something hot, that Impact Wrestling would be on fire. But nevertheless, <laughs> anyway. Well, we tried it without so, naming the website. Maybe next time we should try it. No website, no product, and see what happens. Well, here's the thing. You can go to jimcornett.com anytime right now because there's a bunch of fine stuff to read and look at, but the store is closed. And it will be closed while I now sort through and sign and fill the rest of these orders for these uh, action figures. And we get our wits about us again. I'm I'm not going to paint myself in a corner about when it's going to open up again uh, sometime around the 1st of July, but I want to possibly leave myself two or three days to gather my thoughts after I fill all this stuff. We have talked, as I mentioned, somebody that plans for a new website, a bigger server, a better store are already underway. I apologize. I really do apologize to everybody. If I had been sitting there, hitting a fucking button trying to get back on this thing every five seconds just to get one of these goddamn figures. I would have taken a hammer to my fucking computer and me if I'd have run into me any place out in public. So I apologize, everybody, but we're going to have a bigger site, bigger server. <clears throat> we're going to, this thing's going to be linked into everything that we're doing here the last year or two with the Patreon, the YouTube, all the various media projects um, uh, much better uh, functionality. It's going to take a while. We're not waiting for the new website to come up before I sell another piece of merchandise. Uh, that'll be a few weeks, sometime around the 1st of July, jimcornett.com. Check back. We'll open up for business, COVID-free. But the new website will be hopefully debuting. It would be a wonderful time for this year's holiday sales season that begins in October, so we will hopefully point to something like that and i want also this shows how good how good and decent and wonderful people and fine people that use their left and right turn indicators the cult of cornet is i think i've gotten emails from now a dozen people who says a guy tweeted saying oh either his car crashed or he couldn't get on and he had wanted to get one of the figures for his son that's autistic and they live in Australia. And, and he, and I emailed him back. I said, you know, send me an email, blah, blah, blah. But several people, like I said, about a dozen now have emailed and said, well, you know what? I got one, but just keep the money and, and send my figure to the, to the kid in Australia. He, you know, he deserves it. And that's just, that's ridiculously nice. Um, so don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of him. I have not got back to any of these people's emails as we speak yet, but I have them. And I've got enough, thanks to Steve at Figures Toy for bailing me out with a few extras. And those are the last ones he could get rid of. Um, I, I can take care of the young man in Australia and still uh, fill everybody's paid orders. But uh, a nice gesture from a lot of people. Did you see that apparently there are some people on eBay selling autographed variant figures? Even well, yes. <laughs> technically, there are no autographed variant figures yet. Because this is what this knucklehead has done. And I want to just show you how conniving some people are, thinking they're going to make some money. Some knucklehead, as as Jerry, as Jerry Clower used to say and, and, and James Gregory used to say, some idiot. For, has already gone on eBay uh, with putting listing the figures to for people to bid on them that I have not signed yet. He got in on the fucking order and ordered. I guess there were several people that ordered two, or as, as I looked through, through I think one guy ordered four or whatever, and that that starts to get a little greedy, right? But I'm thinking, okay, and especially when they're pers personalized different ways. There wasn't anybody that ordered a mass amount. I would red flag that and fucking void those people. 
But anyway, so they've listed on eBay. He ordered them and bought them from me for my retail price plus shipping, which is a little hefty to the UK on the theory that he's going to turn around and make money on eBay and when get 29 pounds, I don't even think that's up to what he paid retail plus the fucking international shipping yet. I mean, I don't know how far it's going to go, but that, that, that smacks of desperation to me. And, and, and then, you know, I ought to double cross him. I ought to fucking refund his money and not send the figures. Cause I can probably fix who from the United Kingdom ordered at least two. If, and, and there wasn't that many that ordered more than two. Plus, he specified how they were going to be signed, right? Well, no. Well, see, here's the thing. I haven't gone through each specific order to, to see every single personalization, but what one would think he wouldn't have said autograph it to fucking Oscar. No, but oh, it was, okay. you know, these will be signed. Thank you, fuck you, bye, by Jim Cornette. Something oh, like oh, oh, okay. I see, I see what you, well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. <laughs> See, now that he's he's just called attention to himself, like he could have at least waited until the corpse was cold. He could have at least waited until he got to shit and the sale was over with, but no. He's got to be an opportunist. A carpet bagger. Maybe you might get those figures, and maybe you might not over there, pal. What do you think about them apples? Hope he likes apples. <laughs> so, anyway, what, said, what do you... You said carpet bagger like Kevin Sullivan there. A carpet bagger. <laughs> anyway, so in the, until uh, next month when the store reopens and and we're we're going to revamp some things and also we're probably I'm going to cycle some of the a few things off the the off sale, maybe one of the t-shirts, maybe pare down on the selection of photos or whatever. Try to to make things a little leaner and meaner that we can handle until we can expand a little bit more and everything. But in until you can purchase something at that unnamed website that we don't even talk about anymore. Uh, you can still get plenty of us right on YouTube and on Patreon. Because if you can't hear us on YouTube, well, you can hear us on YouTube 24 hours a day. But if, if you're not near YouTube, then you could be on Patreon. Well, how would you be able to be on Patreon if you're not near YouTube? They should just do both and just have them available, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> official Jim Cornette is the YouTube, and Jim Cornette slash fucking people's tires is the Patreon. What is it? Well, no. Patreon is patreon.com slash Cornette. $5 a month gets you in the door. Another batch of episodes, classic episodes, goes up each and every Sunday evening. And uh, J.J. Dillon actually just went up. You and J.J. talking in 2014. Just about a year's worth of shows of the drive through and the experience up right now. A great way to go through the archives and hear how so many of these feuds began. <laughs> Someone said to me the other day, there's an episode from 2014. They're like, wow, Jim's really nice about the Young Bucks. I th well, I think that was the year before they decided to super kick the kid for his birthday. And I told him what I thought of him. And it, it, it's escalated from there. I don't know. But, it, but, but these are the, the littlest known, the least heard, the lost, if you will episodes of the experience on the drive through before everybody came to realize how fucking great I am. Right. That's right. And I do feel bad because we are starting to see it uptick in comments on the Patreon page with people, I guess people who now really appreciate me coming on board. as the <laughs> Lately, it's been a lot of comments about that. <laughs> well, we upgraded in a lot of different ways there after the first, after the first few seasons when we got our, our feet under us. But anyway, you could, yes, yeah, so you can hear us on Patreon. You can hear us on YouTube until you can purchase me or things related to me on the website. And, um, and while we're at it, one real quick again, also, there was something else that came up last week with the Occult of Cornette Facebook group, and several people had tweeted me. A nice lady named Julia from Memphis had talked about an, an elderly, like a dear family friend, but uh, like a member of the family elderly gentleman that had been in hospice and was a big fan of the show because he'd been a wrestling fan for ages and ages uh papa rich and i had tweeted at the time hey because she had tweeted out something to the effect of you know he was really a fan of the show and it wasn't you know looking good and and i said hey does anybody have our contact information a bunch of people jumped on that julia sent us an email um and uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, 
to connect with the gentleman because he was at that point he was still in, in a coma and uh the last we heard was was not going to be conversational but um at any rate uh we just wanted to say that we appreciated everybody trying to put us together with julia we appreciate julia you writing we're not going to read a long email putting ourselves over again at a, it, under these circumstances but i'm glad that we were able to make him happier when he was in the hospital and and trying to get some talk of old-fashioned wrestling and etc. So that's that. Do you think that the talent in the WWE will be protesting out in the streets, wearing masks, carrying signs, now that one of the developmental talents has tested positive for the virus? The state of Florida is set to be the new epicenter of coronavirus because they have a goofy Republican Trump fuck governor that's mismanaged the whole thing and is going to allow basically gatherings of whoever the fuck contributes to his campaign. Um, did we determine whether or not that Bucky Beaver did say no masks or not? Is that that's being called into question or dispute? Well, I saw a series of tweets and uh, forgive me for forgetting the reporter's name, but it was a reporter from, I think, Orlando. And he said that he spoke to some of the limited fans that were allowed in to the taping. And they said that they weren't. No, 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 no. Wait, wait a minute. That's friends and family, a limited amount of friends and family, friends and family that they said they weren't dissuaded from wearing masks. So other people may have been told other things. Well, wouldn't friends and family want to make sure that they covered up the real wink, wink story. Again, I, I don't know. I've heard a couple different things, but it is noticeable in AEW too. They have everyone sitting right next to each other, no face masks. I think it's uh that's problematic, especially when Florida is seeing such a spike in coronavirus. Well, I'd I'd like to, you know, malign Kevin Dunn for any possible reason, but if he didn't really say that, it was reported that he said Kevin Dunn said if you don't wear masks, you're not a wrestling fan. But that sounds like something Jericho would say if you don't like his matches. Um but I can believe, you know, when you when you know a dipshit, and a dipshit has a history of saying dipshit shit, then you can believe it when dipshit sounds like a dipshit. But we won't indict him here because we don't know for sure he said that. But it's just awful funny that there wasn't any mass anywhere. Because you say, when you look at the AEW crowd, there's some mass. Wasn't, as a matter of fact, wasn't Jake? What Jake was wearing a mask? Wasn't Arn and Tully? I think wasn't they, some, somebody else was wearing a mask. But... I can see Vince being like Trump. Oh, it's weak. Or, you know, oh, I don't want to remind him of that. Or whatever. whatever. You know, I, I'd like to see, a, can anybody get a picture of Vince McMahon wearing a mask? Into a building, out of a building. Any, is he going to the tapings now? He's got to be going to the office. I want a picture. I, I'm putting a bounty out on a picture of Vince McMahon wearing a mask. I bet it won't happen. I bet he will not wear a mask. But, uh, you know, I liked AEW's approach with the, the, the where, what was it, QT Marshall's gym in Georgia, where it was just a few people they had driven in. There weren't a lot of, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of contact with people going through major airports. They had a good setup there. I think everybody should have felt good. Now they've apparently been given the real tests and doing the real tests. Okay, they still, they've got an outdoor arena. You know, they don't have a fucking air system recirculating the fucking the same disease-ridden air. So, you know, okay. But the WWE, not only they bring everybody in, they start giving them the real test after at first they were just taking temperature, right? They give them the real test, and then they test one positive. And then it shuts them down for what they had to cancel part of their day of taping while they figured out what to fucking do. But I think they ought to... It, 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 why wouldn't they have people wearing masks? Because here's another thing. You can still make noise with the mask, but now a lot of these people that they're having at ringside, especially at AEW, they're putting their top guys out there. I don't want to see the top guys be in an audience for fucking tomfoolery. Trainees and underneath talent and fucking, uh, you know, paraphernalia, hangers on, 
the periphery of the extra referees, whatever. That's great, but not so put. If you're going to put the top guys out there, let them wear masks. Remind everybody to be safe at home. Because <clears throat> I'm telling you also, that that's going to be the new hate crime, Brian Last. People that don't wear masks over their snotty fucking nasty mouths. Because I feel like popping these motherfuckers when they walk in a post office behind me. If they get more than six feet away from me, I've had them twice now. I've had to remind an absent-minded motherfucker that he was closer than six feet to me. They take it well, but I'm waiting for the day that one doesn't. If he ain't wearing a mask, I'm going to have to kick him in the nuts rather than hit him in the face. I'm afraid his slobber will get on me. But that will be the people are, that aren't wearing masks and don't have consideration for other people are going to be start starting to be pummeled in the fucking streets. Mark my words. Anyway, I don't know what they ought to do, but I wouldn't be happy about going through the fucking Orlando airport if Florida is about to be the center piece of the new the new epicenter rather of the pandemic i think they ought to show reruns when wrestling was good hey i found the uh the tweets i was talking about the reporter's name is john alba multiple fans in attendance at monday's wwe tapings tell me they were not told they couldn't wear masks several reports in the last 24 hours have indicated they were told they couldn't wear them wwe released a statement about the matter but the fans, I guess, told him that they uh, never felt pressured by WWE not to wear a mask for TV purposes or other reasons. But again, like you said, if they're friends and family, who knows about the statement? Well, and whose friends are they? Whose family are they? I don't know if I'd even trust all the members of your family. No, my family are good people. I'm reading down this uh, thread here. <laughs> One individual told me the waiver included a liability clause in the event they contracted COVID-19 at the taping. They wouldn't hold WWE liable. What? While others could not confirm that. So th there's another rumor that... Apparently wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bo I call bullshit on that. If If... If you are going to open your place of business, whether it be a restaurant or a hair salon, as we've heard so much about, uh, everybody's anxious to get their hair cut or whatever, or a, a, a put on a show of some kind. No, if I go there and get a goddamn deadly illness, it's going to be, it's your fault, motherfucker. Fuck you. I, as a matter of fact, wasn't Trump getting people to sign the waiver to go to his fucking circle jerk in oklahoma in tulsa yeah we well we can hope that that spreads quickly in that fucking environment uh but you know you you actually expect people to go to see something that you are running as a business and but if they catch something that they die from fuck it it's not my fault fuck you if and that's the case then they need to be compensating the people in their crowd then it's a different story. You know, already, as I mentioned, All Elite Wrestling has the highest paid fucking crowd in wrestling. I saw guys I know was making six figures a year sitting in a fucking crowd acting like fans, which is the best place for most of them. Um, I think they ought to start being like that AWF that opened up back in the 90s or whenever, and they just paid the fans to come. So they're, they paid a... A thousand fans, fifty bucks a piece to come watch their big TV tapings. So that meant the house was negative fifty grand. I think if you're going to make people sign a waiver that says they're not, you're not responsible if they catch an illness at your production, you should be compensating them for their risk. Doesn't that seem fair to you? It does. Well, here's a positive uh, addendum to this story. You know, AEW has been testing everyone who is working or attending those shows. In Jacksonville, WWE hasn't been. But as of yesterday, this same reporter, John Alba, says, Sources indicate to me WWE offered free on-site testing for the friends and family of talent who were invited to attend its TV tapings this week on the heels of yesterday's mass testing. If they chose not to get tested, they wouldn't be able to attend. So that's a step in the right direction. Oh, good lord. You know, it sounds like... It... <laughs> It's just a pain in the ass to do anything anymore. I said we're going to have some fun being grumpy. Well, by God, we're going to find there is there's a cloud in every silver lining, and we're going to find it. Bill Maher said on Real Time, which, by the way, sucks without a studio audience and a live panel also, but and he's actually just kind of fucking walking through it anyway. 
Um, but he said, uh, you know, once that everything gets back to supposed normal and after all this is over with or whatever, um, he said, it still may not go back to, because there are going to be some people contrary to popular belief. There are going to be some people who go, you know what? This ain't bad. And, and I'm one of them. I don't need to go out in public now. I don't need to be around fucking people, especially with my phobias and various concerns. And I'm quite happy to, I don't get bored. I never get, I have never been bored in my life. And right now I have enough things that I want to do that I'm afraid I won't live long enough. I never get bored. I never crave social interaction. And I'm pretty much deciding, I think that, yep, I can do this. Post office in the morning, boom, right back home for good. So, you know, he he was mentioning that for a lot of people, that is an option. I see all these people, oh, I can't wait to go out and get a haircut. What the fuck? Nobody's going to see. I haven't had a haircut professionally since February. But since nobody sees me except people at the post office, I don't give a shit. Remember, I cut my hair with the fucking dog's poopy butt trimmers not long ago. Although that would be a really impactful way for your AEW debut if you show up with longer hair and facial <laughs> hair. You finally have lost it. Oh, my God, I've never seen Cornette look like this before. He's really <laughs> losing it. <laughs> I look like I just came out of a cabin in Montana. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages. I'll tell you what, if you are uh, just like I am and you don't give a fuck about being around people and you just want to commune with nature and be in solitude, you know a great way to do it without sweating your balls off? And that's getting one of these rad power bikes. We talked about this on, on the drive through this past week. Rad power bikes are these electric bicycles. And, and they, they, uh, that's kind of makes them sound, you know, slow and difficult because I haven't ridden a bicycle in 40 years, but no, they can go up to 20 miles an hour without pedaling. And then you, you plug them in and recharge them and do the whole nine, nine yards. So it's better for the environment. You don't have to fucking bust your ass to get places. You can tootle around in the, the woods or the parks on these power bikes. Get out and get some fresh air instead of being around other human beings that'll fucking cough germs all over you. And these rad power bikes were voted best affordable electric bike in five different categories by electricbikereview.com. And that just doesn't come in a box of Cracker Jacks every fucking day. The largest electric bike brand in North America. Brian, were you aware of that? I was. I was aware of that. That's That's because you've seen the same... Publicity that I've seen on this fine company. That's right. Uh, but anyway, if you want to get out and about, take care of the environment. Uh, don't have to pedal, which is a, a good thing, especially for the the folks of us who have gone to the top of the hill, looked both ways, and started down the other side. Uh, they are cool and good for you. So anyway, and then you also you can throw them in the car if you drive somewhere, and then you can have like a satellite method of transportation, sort of like if you're out in the fucking starship enterprise and suddenly the shuttlecraft galileo has to fucking shoot off where well, you can take the bike right out of the car and there you go and you're farting through silk anyway you can save some money find a great alternative to public transportation you can get this power bike it's a cross between a traditional bike and a moped you don't need any special driver's license as i mentioned up to 20 miles an hour and these are affordable these rad power bikes cost half as much as the other electric bikes in that particular field. So whether you're hauling groceries, commuting, getting out and about with nature, I understand you could even carry a kid or two on one of these things. Uh, to show appreciation for those that serve us, Rad Power Bikes is offering $100 off all e-bike purchases for active and ex-military first responders, teachers, and students. They've got a dedicated U.S.-based customer support seven days a week to answer questions, and it makes the perfect gift for somebody who loves being active and outdoors. So if you text, I love this. I've never sent a text in my life, but you can text my name, Jim, to 64000. That's 64000. 64000. Text Jim to 64000, and you'll get a free accessory with the purchase of a bike. And that's up to 100 bucks in value and free shipping to the lower contiguous 48 states. 
And they've also got flexible financing for as low as 0% APR. And if it gets any lower than that, they're paying you to take the fucking thing. Text Jim to 64000 I got to say, I want one of those electric bicycles. Well, text Jim to 64000 I, I think I may just do that. Just told you exactly what to fucking do. I want to scoot around town on one of those. It'd be great. Like scoot. All right, we've got an email here from uh, Andrew. Andrew, uh, he has an Italian last name, and he's from uh, uh, Syracuse, so that makes sense. Anyway, Andrew says, I just like this story. I've been a wrestling fan for years since my first event back in the early 1960s at the War Memorial Auditorium in Syracuse when I was maybe 11 or 12. The highlight was Bulldog Bob Brower being choked over the top rope by Elio DiPaolo and spitting a huge glob onto the friend seated next to me. His dad scored us ringside seats, but I digress. My dad once sold beer for a local brewery and stopped into a saloon near the War Memorial to get an order one morning. The place was a goddamn shambles. It seemed that a local two-bit hood named Tony Mano and one of his friends decided to show off and picked a fight with Vern Gagne. As the owner said to, <laughs> as the owner said to my dad, Jesus, I never saw anything like it. Ganya threw these guys all over the bar before finally throwing them out the door. He was still cleaning up the blood that morning. Anyway, I've always enjoyed and respected you. Thanks for keeping real wrestling alive. Uh, so, uh, Vern, apparently, that's one of the reasons why he didn't frequent Western New York after early in his career too much. A possibly lawsuit. File that under one of those nose biting stories, Brian. Last, I'll tell you. Do you file anything that I tell you to file? I always say file something or keep track of this. Do you do that or you, you don't just tell wipe me your to ass file with it? Stuff that often. I well, can't. I'm always saying that keep keep track of it or keep an eye on this or whatever. You just wipe your ass with them and throw them away, don't you? No, I file it. Have you got a file? I I actually have a gigantic file cabinet over have here. A, have a, well, good. All right. Your brakes work on your car. <laughs> you want to break them off and stick them you up break your them ass. off and stick them up your <laughs> ass all right uh we've got another email about I, we had a debate here recently on the various uh merits of the uh, i don't want to say low class the low budget lower budget lodging chains comparing the red roofs and the motel sixes and the econo lodges and, and various things well matt from out on the West Coast, uh, had a story here. And he begins, Jim and Brian, for the record, Red Roof Inns and Motel 6s are both owned, own, both owned, both owned by Accor, A-C-C-O-R. It's, I think it's Accor. I have worked at both brands, and I will agree that Red Roof Inns are better than Motel 6s, but not better by much. All three of the Red Roof Inns in Fresno, California, eventually switched over to a lower-tier hotel franchise. Two of those three became Motel 6s. Hotel brands aside, I do have a story about Kane staying at one of those Red Roof Inns. Back in 2007, I just started my employment at this Red Roof. It was my second day there. I come in the lobby one morning to start my shift, and the overnight clerk asks if I know who Kane is. I did, and he responds, well, he's in that room right there, and points to his room out the window. The computer system said he was a member of the loyalty program, so he must have stayed at a lot of Red Roof Inns. <laughs> Kane, Kane was on the Mick Foley program as much as possible when he was on the road. Um, a few hours later, I see Kane leaving his room and walking straight to the office. I won't lie, I'm freaking out. He walks in, ducks under the door frame, and tells me he broke the desk chair in his room. He said he was on the phone leaning back, the chair broke, and he did a backwards roll onto the floor. He laughed it off and asked for a replacement chair for that room and left the lobby. I let my manager know, and the cheap cocksucker who owns the hotel said to tell him we'd have to charge him $100 for the broken chair. It's literally my second day on the job, and I really don't want to tell him this, but I call him up anyway and relay the message. He says he'll be right there and storms out of his room coming straight for the lobby. He comes in and proceeds to yell at me about how we shouldn't charge him for the chair and he could have been hurt falling backwards. I'm like a deer in headlights because Kane is literally cutting a promo on me. My manager and the hotel owner get involved and they decide on waiving the fee, which they should have done in the first place. The rest of the day, I'm texting all my buddies about how I met Kane and he yelled at me. However, I did get to meet Kane again when the WWE came back to Fresno in 2008 and he was traveling with Funaki. I was able to check both of them into the hotel without any problems and both of them were very pleasant. <laughs> 
He came back to the hotel and almost killed him and tried to charge him $100 for a broken, shitty chair. Well, hold on now. To play devil's advocate a bit, he's on the phone at the desk in his room and he's leaning back in the chair and the chair breaks. It may not be the chair's fault. How much does he weigh? No more than 320, 325 back in those days. I don't know. I think he may be, <laughs> he may be responsible for that $100 chair. But if you're if you uh, are operating a hotel and a guest of yours that's obviously not only a celebrity but also seven feet tall and three hundred twenty five pounds ducks into your lobby to tell you that your chair is a piece of shit and he could have been killed and he's a, a world known sports athlete that that was rotten grammar world known sports <laughs> athlete. <laughs> 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 ah, fuck. Yeah, folks, you can tell I'm uh, the candle is burning at both ends. So this world-known sports athlete <laughs> comes in the goddamn <laughs> lobby, says, hey, I could have fucking hurt myself. I could have sued you. This chair broke. Are you still going to fucking argue with him and try to charge him $100? You're just going to, oh, sorry about that, sir. Would you like to sign a, a waiver? Where do you, you, where do well you draw the line? Yeah. Well, where, do you, where do you draw the line? Hey, uh, I was on the bed and I broke one of the legs of the bed. I've done that before. What I wasn't doing? alone at the time. So it was your fault. No, it was poor constructifying. But I would draw the line at, at if, if, well, I would draw the line if I was the person in the room, if, if Kane had fallen over backwards and was impaled on one of those metal foldable luggage racks and punctured his lung, then I would have sued the red roof. But just breaking the chair and taking a little bump, well, okay. And by the same token, if if Kane had, I don't know, got trapped in the fucking room and freaked out and Hulk smashed out the goddamn wall or window, then I'd want him to pay for that because that seems a little excessive. But I think everybody should have come to a mutual agreement a little quicker on his broken chair you know in the music business keith moon is still a legend not just for his stellar drumming but for destroying hotel rooms was there anyone in the wrestling business known for destroying hotel rooms not on purpose <laughs> they just looked that way after they got finished with them especially depending on what happened in them uh there was the worst I mean, there was a bunch of guys that were always, you know, the back in the territory days, you a uh, town that you stayed in regularly. Uh, sooner or later, the guys would find a hotel where the desk clerk at night or the manager or whatever was a, a fan and was willing to give them, you know, rates or whatever. And then one of the boys would fuck that up, whether it be, you know, getting bad publicity or attention on the, the hotel or the cops coming or getting in a fight in the hallway or doing something stupid. And then they'd, they'd fuck the boys would always fuck themselves. They'd lose those rates. But the worst, just egregious hotel damage ever was here in Louisville at the fucking um, the Suburban Lodge. And it was the boogeyman. And the the uh, Suburban Lodge here in Louisville had a deal with the OVW with all the, the guys that were coming in to train from out of town. It was the, you know, limited stay or limited stay. Um, the, uh, you know, limited suite type hotel where they had a little kitchenette and the room and you got the, you know, a maid service. And also, you know, basically people would stay there for weeks. Extended stay is what I'm trying to say instead of limited stay. Extended stay hotel. And they were giving the guys, this was back in the, you know, mid 2000s, like 69 bucks a week. And you could stay in this fucking nice room, right? But Boogeyman, look at old Marty. I love him. I'm not knocking him. But when they brought him up from Louisville to the main roster, when he still kept his room at Suburban Lodge, because he didn't really have an apartment or anywhere. That was his base of, you know, living operations. But he also left his menagerie. Because he not only had the snakes, but he also had the bugs that the snakes eat and the worms and the fucking various one-celled amoeba and all kinds of creatures, creatures that Dusty Rhodes would say, that he, the disgusting fucking things that he did as part of being the boogeyman, he left them in the room. And apparently, since he was gone on the road for a couple weeks, they got hungry in their individual locations and decided to try to break out 
and start and they started it's it, it was probably like the insect and vermin and rodent world version of the fucking aristocrats joke they started <laughs> eating and fucking and pissing about and fucking sperming all over each other they were eating each other and it infested the entire wing they had to have a whole wing of the suburban lodge fumigated by the time he got they broke in i guess the room the maid service did after he hadn't been seen in a a week or two and the, the shit had run wild and they were getting reports of you know other rooms being affected and did they give him a bill i i i don't i was gone from ovw by that time so i wasn't cuz i would have been that, that's but that's why bill watts in mid south wrestling all the boys were always hot when they got their check from Watts in Mid South because he would pay you every week. But if if this is Wednesday and you got your check for last week, you actually got your check for the week before that. He would always keep back one week's pay because when a guy left the territory, if he had fucked up the hotel or left any unpaid bills, he did. Bill Watts didn't want people in, around the his territory thinking the wrestlers weren't good for it. So he would find out and he'd pay those fucking bills out of your last check. So when you left mid South wrestling for Dallas, you got your last mid South check. What? Two weeks after you left. Uh, well, I'd have to get a calendar and sit here and point at it, but approximately that. Yes. But it's not like he wasn't going to, you know, he was going to fuck us for fuck's sake. Um, but, uh, but yes, and actually, I think our last check probably wouldn't have been very much anyway because we left in midweek and then there was the break for Christmas before we started anyway. So you got an asterisk there. But point is, you had to wait two weeks to find out what your super dome payoff was. So that was pins and needles time. Hello, friends. Sorry to interrupt the program, but a few announcements here. After we were done recording this episode of The Experience that you are listening to right now, Jim trended again on Twitter, and there's been a lot of stories going around, a lot of things that need to be said, and this Monday on Jim Cornette's drive through available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast, Jim will address everything. Jim will discuss everything that's going on, what's true, what's false. Jim is going to talk about it all this Monday on the drive through A second note here. Originally, at this point in the program, we had a segment dealing with a wrestler in England who had been accused of several things. We are going to scrub that from this show. We're going to hold it back because since we recorded this episode, a lot has come out. A lot of things have come out. And to make sure we don't get anything wrong, to make sure we have all the facts and all of our ducks in a row before we address anything, because this is serious stuff that's going on right now in professional wrestling. So. Once again, this Monday on the drive through Jim Cornette will address all the questions you have about what's going on with him and why he's in the news once again, why he's broken the internet once again, this time staying off the internet, he broke the internet, and also the segment that we originally talked about that was going to be right here in the program, dealing with the accusations against a wrestler in Great Britain, those are going to be held back for the time being just to make sure we have all of our facts straight. But with that, I return you to the Jim Cornette experience. Anyway, you know what? I'll tell you what the worst thing is, is living with a chronic pain, whether it's a pain in the ass, a pain in the head, a pain anywhere around living with chronic pain can affect your entire life. And we have talked on the program here recently Many people have some type of pain that's prevented them from sleeping, from relaxing, from exercising, from getting up and getting agile, mobile, and hostile. And that's why our friends at Omax have solved our problems, folks, with the all natural. No problems, no lawsuits result from this. It ain't going to give you genital gangrene like some of these big pharmaceutical companies. This is all natural CBD. The Omax Cryofreeze, the pain relief roll-on that has revolutionized the pain relief industry. Um, everybody talks about it. We love the sport cream. We love all the Omax products. But the, the Omax, the roll-on Cryofreeze gets you where it hurts, whether it's your shoulders, your knees, your hips, whatever. Our entire family talks about it. People that have had hip replacements, knee replacements, all of my various defects that I have physically 
roll some of this on. It starts working within minutes. No cream, messy creams, horrible fragrances, stinky stink like that you get with some of these other potions and lotions. It works within 10 minutes and it will re improve your recovery and performance. And if you go to omaxhealth.com and enter the code JCE, you'll get 20% off the crowd freeze and everything site-wide. 20% off site-wide omaxhealth.com. Enter the code JCE, especially if you have to watch any of the major big show offerings from the supposed big two promotions, which we'll get to in a second, you might want some of this to rub on your fucking head. I don't think you're supposed to put it on your head. Well, that's where that's what hurt after I finished watching those shows. But Omax is great. I used it the other day. I played some basketball with the kids, and then I felt my age. Did you dunk on them? Uh, I did when I lowered the net, but then I raised it back up to... <laughs> regulation to show them how it's really done. how old are the children now uh 13 10 and 2 so you're out there dunking on sub teen or barely teen children I didn't, exerting you, exerting I, your physical dominance on the court dunking on them i mean i'm not dominique wilkins i didn't like jump over them and knock them over or anything i just i they, bet you tried no they wanted to see me dunk i had a clear path what? They weren't in the lane. They want. They they wanted me to charge into them. They I took it on charge, purpose. No. They That's... were trying to draw the foul. It wasn't my fault. There was no foul. There was no charging. They were on the sidelines watching and cheering. Their dad show what a superstar he is. Is that why when they all went in and told Suzanne said, "What does Daddy mean? No blood, no foul." <laughs> uh, they said, "Dad's what? pretty. Dad's pretty good for a five eleven white guy." What, uh, ah, you're six feet if you're an inch. What are you doing on all your various shows? Who are you dunking on on your podcast this week? Another Dunkin' Good Week on the Arcadian Vanguard <laughs> Podcast Network. Get information about all shows on Twitter, at Super Podcast, or on Facebook, facebook.com, slash Arcadian Vanguard. This is one of those delayed laughs I get after you make a comment. Uh, this week on the network, want to make mention of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry, Scott Hudson is their guest this week, but more importantly, there's a big announcement on the show, and I'm actually going to spoil it a little bit and say it here. After four rounds of chemotherapy, Jeff Baldrin currently has no cancer in his system. Excellent. This is excellent news. He has another two rounds of chemotherapy to go, but this is exactly what many of us have been hoping for. This is the best possible uh, outcome to what he's gone through. He's had a really rough year, but we all love Jeff, and this is just fantastic news. Check out his show, Breaking Kayfabe at BaldrinPod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. He's hoping that he'll be a little more fleshy like you like him, Jim, in the next <laughs> several months. <laughs> he, uh, he, he needs to get back to his fleshiness. Also want to make mention of the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review Podcast with myself and Mike Mills at MidSouthPod.com available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Mike Mills and myself go week by week through Mid-South Wrestling, reviewing it, playing audio, letting you know what's going on behind the scenes. We are right now in the summer of 1983. Butch Reed has turned on the Junkyard Dog. Listen to it today, once again, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'm going to tell you something right now, you dirty, greasy dog. Stop selling them wolf tickets. You know, it's weird. They brought him in as a face, and he got over pretty good, and then they just turned him pretty quickly. Well, I think that was probably always the plan because obviously the the money in a single heel is a rivalry with JYD and and they had some great matches even when Butch could go then his knees were starting to to oh, yeah. give him trouble but he could still go and and he could get something out of dog just and also just cuz it was so hot you know it's interesting doing this week by week review there's little things that happen along the way it's like the Mongolian stomper gets built up for two or three weeks Shows up for one taping, never shows up again. <laughs> I, I, Archie was particular and peculiar, as as we've told some stories about when he, you know, walked out in uh, Calgary or when he, you know when he would get the idea that he was being mistreated. He would he just up and go, and I don't know what the story was down there, but uh, uh, it's not uncharacteristic. Can you see him coexisting with Bill Watts? You know. But, <laughs> Well, I mean, if he was if he was used on top 
paid well, a good, you know, spot or whatever. Yes, I can. It, but they were completely opposite personalities. Archie was very quiet, very introspective. Didn't, you know, in the locker room or whatever, didn't, uh, you know, wasn't boisterous or whatever. He may have been the opposite um, personality as most of the guys in the Mid-South locker room. But, it, you know, if it was a good spot and he was making money, he probably could have. But at the same time, I can see where he and Watts might have butted heads a little bit. You want to talk about a garbage replacement. So they build up the Mongolian Stomper for a few weeks, show some footage of him with Don Carson, bring him in. He then leaves right away. They replace his spot for a little while there with Vladik Smirnov, the future <laughs> Korstia Korchenko. Oh, God. One of the worst wrestlers of all time. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was like trading your house for a tent, as Lance Storm said one time. <clears throat> um, but that was, you know, Archie may have got a look at the fucking trips and especially because he lived in Knoxville at that point. He had settled in East Tennessee, you know, back in the 70s. And he might have thought, holy shit, what have I got myself into? When did he start working for the sheriff's department? Uh, probably the mid to later 80s as the territories were going away. And, and he realized at that point he'd been into business over 20 years. And because he was already entrenched there when i was using him in 92 93 94 well hear more about mid-south wrestling once again the mid-south wrestling television review midsouthpod.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts and of course i'll tell you one more one more thing one more thing before you hurt me about archie besides the fact that when he was with the sheriff's department he used to ride his bicycle talk about these rad power bikes he used to ride a regular bicycle like 15 20 miles round trip a day to work and back just to partially stay in shape and then he'd work out also. But he had the greatest excuse for not getting juice I've ever heard. Because a lot of guys didn't like to get color, right? And some guys would have horrible excuses. Like Coco Ware would just say, oh, you know, they, they can't see it. I'm black. Throw powder, right? But Archie actually said, hey, I can't get juice. I transport prisoners. Some of them might have AIDS. I don't know. I can't have any open wounds because I'm transporting, you know, <laughs> criminals. Okay. And what are you going to say? Okay. Yes, sir. Archie, we'll take you anyway. We can get you at that point. You're a fucking icon, right? And, and he never had any problems with those fucking prisoners because they all knew he was the fucking Mongolian stomper. They either wanted autographs or they were afraid to say boo. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, God damn it. I thought you were going to build back up. I wasn't ready. The 605 ready. Super Podcast. I did a reverse order this week. The mothership is circling and getting ready to land. It should be landing by early next week. This is going to be one of our best episodes ever. 605 Your, your, mother, your mothership lands about as often as I open my store back up. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? 605pod.com, available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. We'll have more information next week here on the show, but go through the archives today. And thank you so much to all the new listeners that have been going through the archives. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate all the comments I've been getting. And uh, that's it. The Mothership, next week. Yeah, Mother. Um, we were going to talk about the wrestling match recently on SmackDown between Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles. Uh, on this program today, I had not had a chance to see it, uh, as of when we recorded the drive through because it had just happened. And I said, well, that sounds good. And I want to see that. And honestly, two things prevented me. Well, three things. One was a lack of time with everything that's been going on this week. Secondly, uh, was the on-demand feature for my Fox Smackdown series, whatever on cable. You couldn't fast forward the fucking thing. Well, the fast forward moves at like a snail's pace, but you can't fast forward the commercials at all. And I was not going, I knew that the match was on the last hour, correct? I figured that it'd be the main event. Point is, I wasn't going to go all the way through that for that. And thirdly, and most importantly, we, we talked about AJ Styles, and I tried to make excuses for AJ being a Republican. I said, well, he's small town. He was raised that way, right? It wasn't his fault, you know, et cetera. Religious. Just because he's religious and, and, you know, small town, that's why he's Republican. But now, apparently, a bunch of people on Twitter told me that AJ Styles thinks the earth is flat. Is this true? I probably know what you know, but I have heard the same thing. And then I saw this clip that someone sent me of, 
him and Daniel Bryan talking about it on some WWE show. I'm not even sure what it was. Was it the backstage thing or it was something they did where they they're there's supposedly still in character, but it's supposed to be a shoot kind of a mixed work shoot thing. Well, if it wasn't a shoot, they fooled me because it seemed like AJ got very defensive. Well, I mean, the format of this program is it's they're one of their work shoot things where they get people on the program to talk about shit. Yeah, and it's, and, it's and, not and, backstage. It was something yeah, else, yeah. though. Okay. But Daniel Bryan just said, you're going to talk about me being stupid when you think the earth is flat. And AJ just looked at him like, well, why do, I didn't say that. I, I didn't believe it. I'm just saying there's things about it. What, and that quote again, he said to say, I'm just saying there's there's other other things about if you cannot categorically state on television in public that the earth is round, there's something wrong. And he could not do this. And it didn't look like they were trying to fucking work. It looked like they were <laughs> that Daniel Bryan was having fun with him because they've had this conversation before. Did it not? That's exactly how it looked. It looked like I've been waiting <laughs> to first say this for in front of somebody. It, AJ, you told me once that you didn't believe the earth was all the way around. It, but yeah, because yeah, and Daniel said, so the earth is a sphere, right? And AJ said, yeah, whatever. I'm just saying there's there's some things that, you know. <laughs> I can't vouch for anybody anymore. I can't say anything good about anybody. I can't pull for anybody. I can't want anybody to succeed because everybody is fucking nuts. Whether you, if you like somebody, you find out after however long you've known them days, week, months, years, you've admired their work or you've liked them as personal people or whatever the fuck. And suddenly you find out they believe the earth is flat or they voted for fucking Trump. Or the, the goddamn, they're just insane. Or they participate in this fucking goofy fucking wrestling bullshit that they're calling wrestling now. Whatever the case. I, it's disappointing, Brian. Disappointing. I'm the only person with scruples. Yeah, I feel like we've heard a few things lately about AJ Styles. There was the CM Punk Twitter exchange. The, I guess, accusation that AJ possibly is racist, which we can't speak to that. At least I can't. I spoke to it. I don't think he hates anybody because of their race, creed, or color. I think he's just fucking, at this point, misguided on a variety of options. He seems quite offended by the gay community. We've talked about that. <laughs> and now he thinks the hey, earth Hey, I is wonder flat. how he stands on pork rinds. And now he thinks the earth is flat. So what will be next? What will we find out next about AJ Styles and his Billy Ray Cyrus hairdo? AJ, Time just, will tell. just remember... The Tooth Fairy is not real. But the Easter Bunny, the Easter Bunny has some good shit. Anyway, um, all right, I, I've kept my promise that I was not going to watch the garbage wrestling program that airs on the TNT network on Wednesday nights, the, the outlaw production that is slowly sinking away and losing their grip on life from many, many self-inflicted wounds because nobody can take their own business seriously. Uh, they're too busy waving their PPs around in their hands, uh, trying to entertain everybody, but a wrestling match broke out in the middle of all this foolishness. So I thought we would talk about that. MJF was on the card again. Did you see the MJF match? I did. MJF versus Billy Gunn with his gun sons. I'm mean, that has to be the way that Billy Gunn and the gun sons. I like that. It has a ring to it. What would they call them? The gun club? Um, I, you know, I don't know. It was one of those because they can't say Billy Gunn. So they have to say, here's Billy with Austin. And what did the other son's name is? So-and-so gun. What was the other guy's I, name? Oh, God damn it. I'm sorry. I apologize because I don't know the young man. I'm not trying to slag him off, but Austin looks great. He was the one that stayed ringside. He looks fucking good, too. Billy Gunn's genetics are insane, especially at his age. He looks awesome physically. He's hard as a rock. But I obviously had to watch MJF to see... Once again, him put a clinic on and show all of the rest of these outlaw goofballs that are out there fucking swinging and flailing and flipping and doing nonsense and, and risking their necks and selling nothing, how to have an entertaining and logical and sensical match 
and get yourself and your opponent over and your issue and whatever. And he does this each time. And this was no different. They open up with the classic heel shit. He locks up with a bigger, stronger guy and he can't get the fucking wrist lock. Oh shit. So he's like, Oh, all right. Backs up. Right. Oh, sorry. Um, then they, they, they go into their wrestling and everything makes sense. Uh, Billy Gunn actually blew the, when they were in the, the opening exchange there, one of the opening exchanges they did, it was a roll up spot. Billy Gunn blew it because he turned around. He shouldn't have it. MJF just went into it anyway, backed him up into the ropes and Billy shoved him off and covered it up. So the, the fucking new kids covering up for the veterans mistakes. I'm sure that MJF, he probably didn't have to watch the matches because he knows what they're all going to look like before they actually do them because they all look the same. But he, everything he does is different. Than, and he probably, as I say that now, doesn't have to try that hard to be different from all these other guys. But everything he does in the matches is different. He did the, he did the, he took the heel walk. Fuck it. Billy goes, brings him back. They were gone just long enough from sight. And then here comes Billy with the fucking heel over his shoulder. Uh, then MJF gets from some fucking heat with a dastardly chop block on the leg and were actually worked the people. Imagine that worked the crowd. You legitimately believe that he has disdain in his heart for all these people. Um, Billy fired up a couple times, but he would like one time he missed a knee in a corner so that MJF could go back to the leg. Um, MJF went for Billy's, what does he call it? His ass drop, the, the, the famouser. And of course, missed it. So then Billy got it. But Wardlow, the fucking bodyguard, is up to toss the fucking ring in. Billy Gunn wipes Wardlow out, which gives him a little something and turns around into the fucking shot with the ring. One, two, three. Finishes perfect. MJF over. Billy had a fucking fine showing. Had an out at the end. Heel cheated. Got the gimmick over. Got the fucking match over. They can do it when they try. It's just sitting. It's almost like all the wrestlers on the rest of the card are refusing to actually have a competent, serious, solid, sense goal wrestling match. What do you think? I thought it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, boy, a full throated endorsement yeah, there. You know, it, for what it was, it was all right. I, MJF is very talented. He's very good. Billy Gunn. I can't believe I'm watching Billy Gunn in 2020. <laughs> to be quite honest with you. And, it, and, it, and and once again, he's right there, and his shit's better than the fucking guys that are 20 years younger. No, he, his stuff is good. I do. I do have to say though, when I see Billy Gunn, all I think is, you know what? I'm 40 now. I really need to get on growth hormone. <laughs> I'm missing out. Wow. Uh uh. <laughs> to the prefrontal lobe <laughs> in the knee there. But anyway, no, it, 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 and once again, it wasn't, and this is what they don't understand either. It wasn't the main event at Starcade 86. It wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be a match to get a fucking point across and give MJF another win and keep the thing going with him and probably the Suns, which that'll be gold if MJF gets to tackle Billy Gunn's kids verbally. But then after they do something that's perfect for business, then they, the, there's the heels at ringside. They just got some heat and they get into it with Luchasaurus and jungle boy and old stunted growth. And that would be fine too. If, if I understand they're trying to get, you know, milk the big men, Luchasaurus and Wardlow. But I think, unfortunately, from what I've seen of Luchasaurus, I think he'll bring Wardlow down rather than, Wardlow elevating Luchasaurus and jungle boy is, is no doubt a talent, but when he's in that group, he's just a middle card guy until they start focusing on him. Like the bright spots when he gets out and has a match with Cody or has a match with MJF. If a sustained push for him as a single in a year, year and a half would lead some good results uh, or reap some good results. But right now, they're a middle card tag team with a stupid, goofy looking fucking kid as their mascot. So to have top heels like MJF and Wardlow get into it with these fucking guys right now and lose the heat. They just got have a big fucking pull apart. You don't get a top guy over and then mix him up with middle card guys and their goofy sidekick and then have everybody and their brother getting the fucking middle of it. If you, 
if you're going to build something, don't put MJF in that position. Put the two big guys in the fucking battle of the, the meeting of the bulls in the middle of the ring so they can throw people off of them. But let MJF be out there fucking weaseling out of getting his ass kicked. It just, it, they, they have to, after every match, because they think that's somehow smart booking to continue all the stories. <clears throat> they've made a point with the match and then they have to do some kind of fucking goofy angle, sometimes involving people involved in that match and sometimes not even, or sometimes just barely. And, and uh, would they've just made a point and then you forget the point they just made. Cause they're making another point. They're putting a hat on a hat. Somebody liked that the other day. When I said that they put a hat on a hat, they put a hat on a hat here. That's what I thought of that. But at least AEW doesn't have to take as long to watch as it used to. Go ahead. Don't stop ripping these up. I'm not selling these for charity. These these will go with me to the grave. <laughs> You're going to be buried with your AEW I'm gonna ripped be, up I'm AEW gonna be, notes? I'm keeping a big pile of my ripped up AEW notes. <laughs> They're going to be buried with me. And then it's going to be like the search on Oak Island, right? They're going to be trying to fucking dig me up, find the money pit, sell these fucking notes. Um, but I think there's something that can be done with these. I don't know. Something <laughs> positive and productive. <laughs> well, I'll make more. I'll make more. Anyway, uh, I must apologize to our friends at All Friends Wrestling or All Petite Wrestling or anything except wrestling or whatever that we've termed it here lately, because they no longer hold the status as champions and have the position of having perpetrated the absolute stinkiest, worst offense to the wrestling industry ever in the football field fuckery match. Because now I have seen what WWE called backlash and what we termed earlier in the program should have been backwash. And the only reason, remember, we weren't going to do this. And then Twitter exploded. And it wasn't, oh, this is so great. You've got to see this. It was, you must do this for us, Jim Cornette. You must watch this and articulate what we can articulate on your platform that we don't have to tell people how fucking rotten this was. And I didn't believe it at first. I said, nothing can be rottener more filled with rotten or reeking of rotten than the football field fuckery match. I was wrong. You know, I was on Twitter when that event was taking place. I wasn't watching it. And I think I had put up that we just recorded the drive through. And all of a sudden I started getting inundated with tweets saying, Jim has to watch this. Jim has to watch this. And like you said, it wasn't greatest match ever. Jim has to talk <laughs> about it. It was Kind of like people wanting you to die. It was like, Jim has to see this. He's going to have a heart attack. Yeah. His head will blow up. So I tweeted out, the drive through has been recorded. And no, Jim has not watched, or Jim won't be watching Backlash. Because I thought there's no way in the world you're going to watch yeah. it. And then the next day. Well, said, that that got a worse backlash. No, he's got to watch it. <laughs> we, we demand he, we won't listen to the program unless he watches it. And then the next day, the demand, it was pretty crazy how many people were tweeting at us for you to watch this. And you made the right decision for the cult of Cornet. Yeah, yeah. I always think of others instead of my, I'm that kind of guy. I'm always thinking about, that's what my therapist says. Upon self-reflection and introspection and inspection of me, I've been inspected. They say you're just too nice. You're always thinking of others. Um, I didn't watch this whole fucking thing. There were certain things I skipped over, such as shit that I didn't think anybody should give a shit about. So I landed about an hour in on Jeff Hardy and 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 Seamus. I've I've I'm really Seamus, Seamus, the Seamus, yes, the red hair and the haircut and the translucent skin and the whole thing. I've never gotten. I've said I've been a fan of the Hardys in the past. Um. I'm not sure about Matt these days since he's taken up teleportation. This whole Jeff Hardy's personal problems deal gives me gas. I don't know why they're doing that. It just, I just don't. It's, the one thing they want on this whole goddamn fiasco of a fucking production, they want to make real. They're talking about a guy's real life substance abuse, abuse issues, problems, blah, blah, blah. But 
I was going to give this match an open an open hand. <laughs> I should have given this match an open. I was going to go to this match with an open mind. The first few minutes looked like a shoot and not in a good way. It looked like they were refusing to work with each other or or couldn't figure out how, didn't it to you? It was a little clunky at first, yeah. And then there were other I think this was a clash of styles or something. I don't know. Um, I like Jeff in a tag team because I like for him to be able to do his big stuff, but at the same time, not go the whole way. And I, I think Matt is valuable in, in the, in the team, especially when he sells because Jeff always looks like he's legitimately in pain, whether he's on offense or defense, he looks like he's hurting. And there were just a variety of things where it either, it looked like it, they were trying to make it look like a struggle. I know. And they were succeeding too well whether it was botches or drops or whatever the fuck. Um, and uh, Seamus beat the shit out of Jeff all the way through. He's got a nice backbreaker, uh, you know, nice big kick. I zoned out on a part of this cause it lasted a while, but when there was one point they did one of those spots, they were gonna, both went to the top and, and Seamus got pushed off. And Jeff gets on top, like he's going for the swanton, but Seamus swept the feet and Jeff went just down on top of him and both of them crumpled in a fucking heap. And I thought that may be going to be the finish, but it certainly wasn't the finish the way it fucking happened. And then they went forever. And then the fans started chanting. What I figured out was uh, the fans, I say, the 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 planted personnel. <clears throat> they started chanting, Hardy. Hardy. <laughs> Is that what they were chanting? But yes, it's it Hardy. Hardy. But it sounded like the chants in the omen. Ave criminal. Boom, 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 boom. Ave criminal. <laughs> like Kevin Sullivan's fucking devil entrance music. Hardy. Hardy. He, Jeff Hardy needs fan energy. Because he, it, it, like when he's unplugged, he doesn't sound as virtuostic, virtuostic, as much of a virtuoso as he does when he's got the backing band in there and all the fucking bells and whistles. And the people genuinely like Jeff. But there was another point. Seamus picked Jeff up in a fireman's carry. Jeff held onto the fucking ropes uh, he, so he couldn't give him the fucking move, but it looked like it jerked Seamus off balance too, and he was fucking struggling. And then they're finally a swanton foot on the ropes. Uh, Seamus hits the big kick on the outside when Jeff's coming off the barricade and then one inside and gets the three count. And I don't know whether that was a good match that looked like a fucking shoot or whether it was the fucking clumsiest match between two genuine pros I've ever seen. And the heel announcer buried Jeff at the end. of he's, Jeff Hardy has let everyone down. Wow. <laughs> Pretty much fucking, you know, what worth are you now? He, he not only got beat with a foot in his face, but the announcers are telling everyone because of his personal problems, he let everyone down. I don't remember. Did they show the highlight package before the match of him throwing the urine in the face of Seamus? Um, well, they showed I was skipping ahead. I know they edited that off of uh, a Fox something or other replay or something, or did they edit off of Fox entirely? Oh, I the don't know. Throwing. I didn't hear that. <clears throat> that was a story that I just heard about this morning that it was somehow edited somewhere by Fox for later airing or whatever. But it was USA Network Southwest Championship Wrestling pig shit in 1983. Same fucking thing. They don't like the excrement and the urination on network television. I heard Jake Roberts heard about the angle and thought that was a waste of perfectly good piss. <laughs> All right. Now, anyway, I mean, but that was that match. Nothing to write home about. Yeah. It I did. It was. it was what it was. I did also watch. Miz and Morrison against Braun Strowman for the for those of you who didn't see this let me explain this to you Miz and Morrison have pissed Braun Strowman off so bad that he wanted them in a handicap match but also since Braun Strowman is one of the many world champions that they have now he's the universal champion which is even bigger than the world 
in this handicap match, he agreed to put the universal title on the line, but all this time, Miz and Morrison thought that they would be co universal champions, even though they've been professional wrestlers for 20 years and that's never happened ever before ever. They assumed that that would be the case until they were told right before the match that no, whoever gets the pin on Strowman would be the champion. And now that's causing dissension in their team. Could they be any stupider? Could a, a NBA player not know the rules of the fucking game? What the fuck? And why was, why would this be the rules of this fucking match? No, they couldn't be any stupider. So anyway, this is the premise of this match. Uh, and also during the backstage promo, I don't know who or what Miz was looking at. He wasn't looking at the interviewer that was speaking to him. He wasn't looking at the camera. He wasn't looking at his partner. He was just staring off while he was addressing all those people. So we've established that the one of the world champions is defending his title in a handicap match against a mid-card tag team because that's where all the tag teams are placed. And if they win, oh, oh, I forgot now. Wait a minute, because then at the end of that promo, Otis and his blonde, his fake blonde with the pneumatic tits came in. What's her name? Mandy Rose. Okay, Otis and Mandy came in. And in the, their part of this horribly scripted phony promo they've announced that he may if one of them wins the title from braun Strowman, he may cash his briefcase in against them so the way we've set this up is the champion defending the title in a handicap match against a mid-card team and if they win one of them might face a preliminary comedy guy for the one of the most prestigious titles in the company did i Sum that up, Bill. Well. Oh, yeah, no, that's what we okay. established. Yeah. All right. Then here comes uh, Ms. and Morrison's interest entrance. Morrison looks like a rock star. Ms. looks like a fucking bullfrog. And before they do this match, they intro a new music video about Braun Strowman. And I got to admit, I like this. It was placed poorly. If this had been on television on network TV where a large group of people could see it leading up to the big show. It may have made people more interested in seeing Stroman kick their fucking ass. But since they're showing it here, when the, the fucking audience is already in the goddamn building for the big match, cause it's about to happen. As they say, the fucking crowd is watching it already. This video did not get any more heat on the heels to promote this match. It just wasted some time. So we didn't have to see so much of Stroman wrestling. Because that was fucking brutal. Um, did they rip off the Van Halen right now piano part and tune on that song? Oh, I don't know. I was too busy wondering, did they update Jerry Jarrett's house? This looks like one of those <laughs> fabulous ones videos. <laughs> all right, everybody, including Rocky the Ramon and, and all of our musically inclined fans out there, go back. If you if you dare and listen to this fucking music video and tell me that they didn't rip off the fucking right now right now uh, piano and fucking a little bit in there I I I I could hear it. it wasn't scalding but it was there anyway the Strowman entrance interrupts their music video the fabulous one strike again everybody wants you Dan it Dan it um. They did the, they had a match. They did the big man, little man stuff. They had a match, you know, Andre's first round where he would, a lot of times Andre, his first time around the territories would be booked, especially down South where the guys were smaller against a heel tag team that had, had been featured on top, but was about to leave the territory. Didn't mind beating them you know, whatever the case. And this was the kind of match they'd have. Only Andre was more impressive and, you know, the guys had more heat back then, but that was a standard way they're working it. I love the way that Morrison bumps and moves around and everything. And I wrote there, there wasn't anything wrong with this, especially they doubled up and they got heat on Strowman. And that's where you, the, the, the weak part here is Braun Strowman is not easy to work with when he's selling because he's not real good at it. And how can you move him around? And you can tell it's like, you know, they just have to kick the fucking horse when he's down, but he was like Luchasaurus when he was trying to fucking sell and didn't know how. He just beached. 
And then suddenly he just started a comeback for no apparent reason, but other it was time. And boom, 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 he bumps him around, but then finally Strowman gets hit by the big double team where it was Miz's move that he stole and executes badly from Dennis Condry. The skull crushing finale with a double stomp in the back, and it, it looked pretty fucking stiff. And Morrison covers him, and then Miz breaks it up. Because it's like, what? Well, oh, it, it just out of, you know, I want to be the champion, you know, not thinking about it. And then realized what he'd done, emoted like he was fucking sorry, and Morrison covers Strowman again. You can't be a little bit pregnant. If you're going to do that fucking finish, then you you don't look like a fucking Weasley heel. You just look like a goddamned idiot. Unless you're going to turn on the guy and try to steal the fucking thing. Let your partner get the fucking pin. You pull your partner off the pin, change your mind 15 seconds later. Oh, gosh. He gets back on him, then he gets kicked off. Did that make any sense to you, Brian? No, it was weird. I mean, I get the idea of him pulling his partner off and then selling it like he can't believe he just did that. You can go somewhere with that. No, I can't believe that because he would know why he just did that because he just fucking did it. That was the point. If you're going to do it, fine, but don't do it and then wonder why you just did it. Well, to me, the stupider part was Morrison going for the pin right away, just jumping on him. Okay, well, you know, he's been down a few more seconds, but let's try this again. Well, yeah, well, that was that was what was called in the finish. <laughs> So this, they couldn't do anything else. Um, anyway, and then so by that time, Strowman gets up and drops both heels and beats Morrison. They still beat John instead of that fucking Miz. Every time I see them work, he gets beat instead of fucking Miz. I'd be I'd I'd book matches in my fucking house in front of no people, just have Miz do jobs. He just annoys me. Just annoys me. Anyway. That was that. Did you see anything on that match that I didn't notice? No, I really don't have too much to add to that match. I, I will say, going back to that promo beforehand, it's like in some respects, there are so many people who are so shitty at reading their scripts or memorizing their scripts. You look at The Miz and you're like, he's pretty good, all things considered, but then he just, it's just, it's so... And this is really my theme with everything, with the commentators, with some of these guys on promos, it's just all so insincere that it makes me tune out. That's a very good for insincere. Sincerity is the key. When you can fake that, you've got it made. Because like I said, it's the same thing with the commentators. Every time they went to Michael Cole and Corey Graves sitting there and you actually see him gesticulating, you actually see he does as much <laughs> finger pointing as Kenny Omega, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> when you see Michael Cole doing all that, and you hear the way he's speaking, the tone he's speaking, it's so insincere that I tone it out, uh, that I tune it out. And it's the same thing with a lot of these promos. They're, it's not just the Miz looking in what direction is everyone looking at? There's a person next to you with a microphone, and then there's a camera. So right there, you have two wonderful options. Option three is the ceiling. <laughs> it's just everything is so insincere. And look, wrestling in and of itself is insincere, but there could be a level of sincerity in that the same way there is when you watch The Sopranos or The Wire or something else. Sure, this is a show. Sure, all these people are going to go back to the trailer after they're done. But in the show itself, there should be sincerity. Everyone is just an insincere doofus who acts like a child or talks sincerity. to you like a child. Sincerity. Well, I sincerely fucking hated this next thing and i'll tell you why they drew mcintyre and bobby lashley i d it's like have they given up now on mcintyre because here's the guy he beat brock lesnar he beat big show he beat seth rollins and i like bobby lashley he worked with us here in ovw i know him i haven't seen him in a long time but i've always been a fan of his he's a physical freak he's a great amateur wrestler He's, he's his pro wrestling now is better than I ever thought it was going to be. Uh, and that's not a knock. It just, he started late, but Bobby Lashley was just, when we were watching raw, what a month ago or a little more was in an underneath comedy deal with a bunch of fucking underneath guys. And suddenly he not only is wrestling the, uh, the other world champion, 
but he beat up. He jumps him before the bell, <laughs> puts the full Nelson on him. And, and fucking the referees have to pull him off. He beats him up in his robe. McIntyre didn't get his robe off half, halfway through the match. And, you know, what the fuck did they think? Okay, this guy was in the middle doing ha-ha last week, but now, because he looks great, we can just put him in the main event. And what the fuck with McIntyre? He beat all these other guys in minutes, but now, you know, this guy's going to beat him up for 20 minutes. I didn't get the fucking logic. Well, let me just say, and again, I've watched Raw just about as much as you have over the past few years. But I was under the impression, despite the goofiness and the ha-ha, as you put it, of the Bobby Lashley, Rusev series of angles, that wasn't mid-card. That that was higher up on the card. Oh, it just came up, came off that way. Yeah, I mean, that was the segment they were closing out Raw with for a while. That was the main thing. And I, I actually thought... I not even some fucking thing with a bunch of masked luchadors. I hadn't seen him with MVP So that was new to me because I haven't been watching their show, but MVP can cut a good promo. And I was like, oh, maybe this is something new they're doing to Lashley. This makes sense. Him coming out with MVP, okay, that's a good way to try to repackage him. And with McIntyre, name me a more unfortunate world's champion in their (laughs) history. This guy's got a look. This guy can work. Everything since he's won the title has been no crowds. It's time to put the belt on him at WrestleMania. (laughs) And, and, and there's nobody in the audience and right. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he's snake bit. I feel bad for him, actually, because he, yeah. is, he is a talent and he's in a really bad situation right now and it's not a situation of his doing. It's just, I hope they don't give up on him, quite frankly, because you know how Vince is with these two kind of things. You know, he'll think that he's not getting over because there's no fans there <laughs> for him to get over in front of. Well, but he's getting over with the fans that are there. Uh, but anyway, and, but anyway, this was not a horrible match. This was good, hard-hitting stuff. When when McIntyre finally got started, got his robe off, and got up and started doing some stuff, I just didn't think they should have grounded him right at the start there. Um, but, you know, it, it, I hated to see him sell so much right at the start in a match like that when they brought built him up as a world beater. But Lashley is definitely he's a physical marvel. So they hit all the big bombs. And boom, 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 back and forth. But then Lana comes out. They're still claiming that he's Bobby Lashley's wife. Even With MVP, Lashley looks like something. They look like a package. It's fucking Lana, that pulled back hair. She's phony as a football bat. She came out and phonied it up. They had to do the awkward teases of of almost running into her. Then she gets bumped into MVP and, and McIntyre hits the kick. One, two, three. It, it, get the use cut cut off the useless part of this equation get rid of the fucking girl get lashley some wins under mvp let mvp talk and cut some promos and then you will have a force here but whenever they do this phony bullshit contrived his wife and they're married and there's detention in the lashley home no they're not married and nobody believes it and it looks phony Get rid of this fucking chick. Concentrate on what might make you some fucking money. That was my goddamn reaction to that thing. I, for the most part, I liked the match. The finish ruined it for me. Why did she climb up on the apron? She was trying, she was saying to the referee that, that he wasn't doing something right or when she was complaining to the referee just out of nowhere because however they called it when they, went over it verbally it sounded like it'd make more sense than it looked like when they did it that's what i gathered from it yeah that finish ruined a perfectly good match that was completely unnecessary yeah she's unnecessary all this fucking jerry springer household housewife drama is unnecessary because nobody believes it it just gets in the way speaking of getting in the way should we talk about the Raw Tag Team Championship between the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders. This is the bone of contention that everybody wanted me to see and talk about. Have I gone far enough into this now that you could put this on YouTube and I can start using fucking cuss words? Well, we will find out. Ten nine eight seven six five four three two one. Fuck this whole fucking thing. 
I don't know what to say. I don't know what I was watching. I don't know why this happened. I don't know why it was aired. I have no words to describe it. I don't know why that everybody involved in it didn't immediately tender their resignation and walk the fuck out. You know what? Because the street profit, and I used to like the Viking Raiders, not the fucking gimmick, but the goddamn guys, fuck them too. If I ever see them again, I'll tell them in person, fuck you for being involved in this. I have never needed a goddamn job. I've never needed money so bad. I've never had so lack of self-respect or respect for my profession that I would have not walked. I've walked out on a lot less than this. And I think they ought to be ashamed of themselves. I think whoever pitched this idea should not only be fired, but potentially beaten up in an alleyway somewhere by fucking street thugs that are hired at a later date. If anybody had suggested that this was a good idea for me to do in a promotion that I ran, I would not only have fired them, I would physically attack them. Uh, I, I don't know I w if, if it was my company and I had a choice of airing this or airing nothing, I would air Mighty Mouse reruns. I, it, we, it, it's got to the point now where when, when they can make AEW look like the more fucking reputable organization with all of the WWE's resources and the talent that they have on the roster and the talent that they have in the production studio and the talent that, that, that they have or just the, the high price talent that they have, that they would allow something like this on their program shows that nobody that knows what the fuck they're doing is either in charge or can stand up to Vince or has the backbone or the balls or the guts or the scruples to fucking walk out over goddamn principles. And I hate everybody involved in this, and I never want to see any of them again personally or professionally. I, 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 why would you even do so? It wasn't even funny fake. It wasn't even entertaining fake. It was silly fake and stupid fake. And they all ought to be ashamed of themselves. And it, it as a matter of fact, if I'd have been Randy Orton and Edge, I would have gone up to all these guys, and including the agents, including the creative team, and I'd have slapped them all in the fucking face because they pissed all over Randy Orton and Edge. After I watched the, most of this match, after I started fast-forwarding to see when it would end, and finally when I did fucking fast-forward to the one point they were in a dumpster, and that was so fucking fitting, I said, if that ain't the finish, it ought to be. You ought to, you ought to put garbage in a dumpster and close the fucking lid. I got out of it there. I had to stop watching the show. I wanted to see Randy Orton and Edge. I wanted to see how they lived up to their billing and or just as I've always liked Edge. Orton's a fucking premier worker. That was something I was looking forward to watching. And after this fucking thing, I turned the goddamn thing off and I had to go away from it and walked around for about an hour and did other things. And the only reason I came back to it and watched Orton and Edge was because... Well, two reasons. Number one, I didn't want to waste that much time on the rest of this fucking stinker just to not see the only good thing on it. And secondly, I knew people were going to be waiting for it, and I wanted to be able to at least say something positive about somebody. But if, I, if it hadn't been my profession and what I'm supposed to be doing for the program, I would have never come back to this fucking show or watched any of the rest of it again after this fucking horse shit. Fuck you, Street Profits, whoever the fuck you are. I've never met you. Fuck you, Viking Raiders. I know you took the shitty gimmick because you got a job, but doing this, fuck you. Drive a fucking truck, motherfuckers. If Bruce Pritchard had anything to do with this, I hope Paul Bosch reanimates from the grave and sodomizes him, just fucks him until his soul leaves his fucking body. Fuck you, Bruce. Anybody else? Can you think of anybody else that we can directly implicate in this, before I talk anything about the details, Vince McMahon. Well, Vince McMahon is obviously, we now have proof that he's insane, has lost his mind and is senile and is babbling and fucking spilling his goddamn oatmeal all over his fucking lap. The Vince McMahon I knew would have never let 
a bunch of a, all the things that he even did in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> something as amateurish and stupid and silly as this. They start out fighting in a parking lot, but then because they break Braun Strowman's windshield, they all four run off scared. The tag team champions and their challengers, all four of them are scared of one guy. So already I knew the guys were jabronis in the thing to begin with. Then they've, then they're fighting in the back of the arena with marching music. Then they have a face-off with golf clubs and axes and a bowling ball. I'm not kidding. But then they decide they shouldn't use those things. So they talk it over, put them all down, and then start fighting again. Here's how stupid they all are. They were laying shit in, trying to make their work look good while they were being obviously phony on purpose. I guarantee you, I've never, compl well, I've complained a few times to my boys, but never to the opposite side, really. But I'd, I'd never complained about guys laying shit in to make shit look good if they weren't reckless. But I would complain a long and loud of a motherfucker laying something in to make it look good while we were doing something that was so obviously phony we could never make anybody believe it was real to begin with. Then, I don't care whether your work looks like the shits. Don't fucking hit me hard trying to convince people when we're doing something they, they can't be convinced over. That's fucking stupid. Then they were eating turkey legs. Then they got knocked through a glass door. A, a Viking flashed back to a, a, bowling, a, a game of bowling, and we could see the fucking flashbacks in the guy's mind. And then he threw the bowling ball into the street prophet's nuts. Here's what I wrote verbatim. I hate all four of these guys. I hate whoever told them to do this. I hate the idea of this. I'm not sure if it was a flashback or a dream sequence. Whatever it was. They should have sent out the fucking LSD so that we'd all be on the same page. Then we might not have minded it. Ninjas on motorcycles showed up. What was the meaning of the ninjas on the motorcycles? Has this has something been done with a team of ninjas on a motorcycles that this is referring to, or they just they just showed up and interrupted the fucking fight? I believe this may have been the debut of the ninjas on motorcycles. I don't know anything about it. And I wrote, well, the WWE is now the biggest garbage wrestling promotion in the world. It's made for football field fuckery look like Fez versus Rogers. So then the Vikings and the Prophets join up to fight the motorcycle ninjas, and they go through a quick series of clips of goofy spots, so I started fast-forwarding to see what it would fucking end. I stopped. They were fighting again. When I left, they were to joined up, teamed, fighting the motorcycle ninjas, but then they were fighting each other again, and then I fast-forwarded some more, and then they knocked each other off a goddamn fucking uh, uh, semi-trailer truck. And I fast-forwarded a little bit more, and they were all laying in the dumpster. And that's where I just turned the show off and walked away from it. And the virus, as I said before, and you can go back, what, a month or so ago, I said the virus is going to be what kills wrestling. Because now that they've been forced to try to be creative, they're doing this shit and they're getting a tickle out of it and they like it, so they're going to do more of it. And it's going to get worse and worse. I don't know how it can be worse than this. I could actually smell my computer monitor from watching this on the network. But it, it, this, the virus has killed wrestling. They're either going to computer generate the shit or they're going to do more movies or cinematic approaches. I'd like to give you a cinematic approach of a fucking John Holmes movie and splooge right in your fucking eye, Kevin Dunn and all the rest of you. And this is what they're going to be doing. And it's it. And by the a, a year of this and nobody will ever want to watch anything that's called wrestling ever again. I'd, I'd like to say a positive comment. Uh, like you, I hated the stadium stampede match with AEW. I thought it was an embarrassment. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was bad comedy put together that was acceptable by the dwindling wrestling audience. But by and large, people who like professional wrestling or comedy 
would realize how stupid it was. But if I could say a positive about that match, at least Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon weren't involved in it. <laughs> because now you're seeing, you know, I've said how AEW is those guys, their version of WWE wrestling. It's not sports-based wrestling. It's not a modern take on Mid-South wrestling. It's not a modern take on Nitro. At this point, it is their version of WWE wrestling. And this was WWE's version of the AEW cinematic Shh. match. Oh. This by the way, was there's the a way to do it. I mean, that's the thing. The next match on the show was a cinematic match. It was a match with various elements from, from crowd noise to Howard Finkel being reanimated to cuts in the match, like well, the elements of the match that were put together in post-production. That's a way you could do it where at least it's not insulting. But this shit, I don't know what this was. I mean, you missed another dream sequence. You missed so much. Yeah, I would have missed I would have missed wrestling for the rest of my life if I'd have seen any more of this. I was disgusted but, but by know, the I whole thing. I was repulsed by it. I understand being really mad at the production team and whoever was the agent and whoever came up with it and the head of creative and Vince McMahon. These four guys in the match are four guys with their first real chance to make some money. I don't give a fuck them. Fuck them. Have some fucking balls, some fucking principles. Go out and make a goddamn idiot out of yourself on national TV and shit all over the wrestling business. Fuck them. I've walked out for less. And and adjusting my fucking WCW contract for inflation, probably on around the same amount of money. I don't give a fuck. Fuck everybody had anything to do with this. Fuck anybody that liked it. I'll slap you. How about that? <laughs> Fucking tell me, man, woman, or child, 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, if you can't walk, I'll drag you. You tell me you like this, I want to slap the fuck out of you. This was bad. This was pretty bad. And I was so upset that when I finally sat down and then watched the worthwhile match on this fiasco, I was more insulted and offended and upset for Randy Orton and Edge. And now we find out Edge tore his fucking tricep. He's going to be out for a while. They go out there and fucking put on a clinic, have the closest thing you can have to a masterpiece in this day and age in wrestling, um, fucking work their asses off, and Edge gets hurt and is going to have to have surgery, and it was all for naught because nobody could take a goddamn bit of it seriously because they had just seen the whole business mocked and, have it, and made a joke of by a bunch of fucking underneath twats that shouldn't be in a fucking ring. And they weren't in a ring. They didn't even use a fucking ring. I did like the MSG microphone and the Finkel announcements. That was great. The referee instructions being mic'd. That was great. Imagine that. The announcers actually said, see, there's rules in this match. Like, there's not supposed to be rules in every match. We've come this far that it's a special attraction because you presented a wrestling match with rules. That's like if I'd been a kid and my mother said, I'm going to give you a special sandwich today, Jimmy. It's going to have bread. Fucking dipshits. No wonder I can't stand any of this shit. They started sweetening the crowd at the start, out of that, out of the music and the, the, it's at the presentation they made. So you wouldn't really notice it. And it wasn't bad at the beginning, but I it started to grow. By the end of it, I was really getting pissed because you, it, if they'd have said, "Okay, we're going to go to a a small uh, uh, arena, or maybe even the fucking uh, a warehouse in the Titan at Titan Television over on Hamilton Avenue, and we're going to put fifty people in there, we're going to have them make some noise," but they were using legitimate crowd noise of a crowd of thousands, Brian. You can't know. It was visually and fucking audio wise. It it conflicted and was distracting. Did, did, was it not to you? It was. I mean, I also thought it's ridiculous when you have a bunch of developmental wrestlers chanting, "This is awesome!" and fight forever. Oh yeah. But when that sound is amplified by thousands and thousands of fans <laughs> who aren't there, that, that's a. It's almost as bad as the weird 
chanting of the monks during the Hardy match earlier. Well, it, it but here's the thing. B- bring that up also, the fucking chanting of the the crowd. This is awesome. No, no, it's not awesome when the heel is beating up the baby face. That's when you're supposed to be chanting and cheering for Edge. And no, you don't want them to fight forever. You want the baby face to win quickly and cleanly as, as quickly as possible. You don't want the match to go on forever. That's fucking stupid. When's the last time you saw a fucking Muhammad Ali fight or a fucking UFC title match where they're going fight longer? No, they're cheering for one guy to get his fucking ass knocked out. And to ha- and the, so the developmental wrestlers are as are smart marks. The trainees are not as smart to the business as probably half the people that would be in the stands because they're going fight forever and this is awesome in the wrong places. No. And the sweetened crowd, distracting. It took away from what these guys did. This match would have torn the house down with a crowd in any arena or any stadium, but it also would have been good without their fucking audio tricks with the crowd they had in the building because you could hear the smacks of the meat and the flesh. Physically, the way this was worked, these two guys were... Cl- this. Is this this is as close as you're going to get to fucking Flair and Steamboat with today's crowds. Even if they'd have had a crowd, it wouldn't have been as good as Flair and Steamboat because they wouldn't have had the 1989 fucking crowd in Chicago or Nashville. If you'd have put Randy Orton and Edge in front of a crowd from 1989 in Chicago or Nashville, this would have been as good as Flair and Steamboat. But since the people are all fucked up, you can never get that good again. But from the from the opening opening arm drag spot two technicians tight headlocks tight lockups facials reactions the little shit the timing the the whether to register whether to sell um we have mentioned this samoa joe to me has a new career yeah we wish the other fucking guy would shut up next to michael cole so we could hear more joe i thought he was great and added a lot to this um <clears throat> be honest with you, I think his his go to word is gentleman. When he calls the another uh, the other announcers gentlemen, that works every once in a while. I think he said gentleman like seven hundred and forty six times. It's a go to word because he's still new at this, but he's going to be fucking excellent. And there's part of the problem with their announcers. You thought that was Michael Cole? That was an announcer trained by Michael Cole. Was that not Michael Cole? I think it was that Tom Phillips guy. Well, fuck, I can't. It sounded like Michael Cole. They all sound the same. They well, all I- sound the same. <laughs> Well, Joe sounded different. Um, here, by the way, we mentioned Happy Feet uh, here lately on the program and the the Mongo uh, Steve Mongo McMichael Twitter account, and we talked about what Happy Feet is in a training class. If go back and watch this match, when you see Edge crisscrossing the ring, the opposite of Happy Feet. The uh, it, both he and Orton so smooth, crisscrossing, hitting the ropes, changing things up, whether they're leapfrogging or bending over, ducking a move or whatever. And also, when you watch a guy that really knows what he's doing, you'll see that Edge takes three steps and turns. When he's hitting the ropes, no matter what, he's uh, crisscrossing the ring, three steps and turn, three steps and turn. And also, except if, as I mentioned, he's ducking something or doing a move, when he's crisscrossing the ring, his head, he's got a level head. That's what you watch. Once the guy gets the footwork down, you'll be able to watch the head also. The head is completely level from one side of the ring to the other. Three steps and turn, head's level. That's when you know somebody's got something. These guys always knew where they were in the ring and the, the way that they lay their hands on each other, the way they grip shit, the way they struggle sometimes, the way they work the fucking holds. Um, they built to a big spot where Edge you know, clotheslined Randy on the fucking apron. Anyway, headbutted him off the apron and then gave him a big clothesline off the top. Edge went to the floor and both of them sold it. Randy got a little juice, which seemed like it was natural because uh, there wasn't enough of it to be a uh, gimmick. And and just everything looked good. They sold everything. They registered. They reacted to everything. Everything made sense. I really started hating the crowd sweetening when Orton was bouncing Edge off the desk because that's where it got distracting. 
uh, but they did the Great Chop Exchange. They would build up these exchanges where they then they would pay off, and then they'd both be down, or they'd let it breathe, or they'd enter a new stage, the, the ebb and the flow. That's the one superplex was made to seem like a career ending move. They replayed it three times. The guys, both of them sold it. Imagine that. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that double cross body in a while, but I love it on two full grown guys. You know, you see sometimes the little midgets try to do it, but did you see after the double cross body, double knockout, boom, they land and it looked good in slow-mo. They didn't even have to do the slow-mo speed up trick. Boom, knocked the piss out of both of them, it looked like, but then Orton rolled over and grabbed Edge's wrist, check, check to see if he was okay, and Edge gave him the office real quick, and off they go. Um, They put in some twists and Explain turns. That. Go ahead. Because some what? of the listeners may not understand what you just said about going for the wrist and then getting the office. Explain what that means. Okay, well, you'll see, basically, Randy rolled over and just touched Edge's wrist which was kind of like, a, are you okay? And you see Edge move his fingers a couple times and tap. I mean, it, 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 when you give somebody the office, it's the same thing, give, give me the Iggy, give me the office. You're giving them a heads up on something. But, for example, if I lock up with you, Brian Lass, and I take your arm and I crank you up in a wrist lock and I'm cranking your arm, right? You know how sometimes the guy that's getting that done will go ahead and reverse it? He'll spin under and reverse it. Well, if I've got your arm and I real quick squeeze your wrist with my thumb and forefinger two or three times, tweak, 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 that's giving you the office. That means reverse this. If it's a hold or if you grab somebody, you're checking on them. If they give you the tweak, tweak, that means they're okay. It's giving you the office means alerting you to something in a, in a, if, if you, if you've got a chin lock on me and you're laying on my fucking back and you're fucking cinching up and I can't breathe and I need you to get your fat ass up off of me, I'm going to fucking grab your arm around my neck with both hands and I'm going to give with both hands. I'm going to give you that tweak, tweak, tweak. And that's loosen up motherfucker. And the next thing you get, if you don't do that is my thumb in your fucking eye. So there's a variety of ways to non-verbally communicate. Um, and I was, I was going to mention they did the twists and turns, foiling moves and reversals. And at one point, Randy had hit the fucking edge with something and he put his head down. Like the deal where you put your head down and you're going to turn the guy with your head and you're kind of bulling under him. And I thought it was Michael Cole. Now you've made me question that. But whoever the fucking Michael Coleish announcer was said, he's going to shoot the half. That came directly from Vince. We used to, when we would have just creative meetings and Vince sometimes would go off on a, a, a tangent about things he didn't like, like the, you know, if you're being choked in the corner and your hands are on the ropes, instead of the guy's hands around your neck, you don't like that. And he'd also, and these guys are getting so complicated. They just go for these covers. They look so lax. He's why don't they just shoot the half? Like that was Vince's way to communicate that he was well-versed in amateur wrestling, you know, a full Nelson, which Lashley used in the show. Everybody knows what a full Nelson is. Well, a half Nelson is if you hook your arm up around the guy's arm and shoulder with one side, but not the other. That's a half Nelson. Well, Vince would always say, well, I ought to shoot the half. Just shoot that arm in there and turn the guy over and hook him, right? He wanted legitimate looking covers. And this shoot the half was his method of being Dana White, right? So you know that that announcer was told in his, or has been told many times before, and just now does it naturally, as you know, Vince said, well, tell him to just shoot the half. Orton was not shooting the half. He would put his head under him, not his arm around the guy's fucking shoulder. But he got away with it. Anyway, after he shot the half by not shooting the half, they went into false finishes. All of them were plausible. That great cross body off the top by Edge. He still, I mean, at his age. Um, I saw the camera angle under the DDT. And they did another screwy camera angle I didn't like because that once again diminished the work these guys were doing. You, uh, even if they made a couple of edits in other places, that didn't slap you in the face. Um, you know, you couldn't really tell unless you're uh, experienced in television production and looking for something like that. You could take this ride with Randy Orton and Edge and think this was in one piece except when it did those stupid angles. There's no way that the camera could have been under them in that situation. So that was disrespectful to the effort that the guys were putting on. 
We talked about the the chance from the fucking marks, it, mark trainees. This is awesome and fight forever's bullshit. Um, I finally they teased the fucking you know they did other guys finishes before they did their own big ones, which I thought was kind of cool because normally. I'll say, well, you did fucking Randy Savage's elbow drop and reminded people that fucking Randy Savage wasn't there. But in this case, these guys were bigger stars than the people whose moves they were doing or more current stars. Uh, Edge did Christian's move, but let's face it, Edge probably n nudged Christian in that race. Um, wasn't it uh, Orton did a fucking angle slam? But, well, Kurt's retired now and you know etc but it wasn't like and also these guys are major stars so it wasn't like they were doing other guys shit and putting me in mind of the other guys they they used the other guys finishes to warm up to where they could use theirs and they and nobody would kicked out of their own finishes and then finally the series of cradles into the rko the first time but boom but then the spear out of nowhere and it hit him with it again those spears look fucking wicked uh, the second RKO out of nowhere false finish was great. And then finally, boom, Edge clamped that fucking choke on, but Orton hit, the. they missed it, a, a shot of it, a clear shot of it first, but Orton hit the fucking questionable low blow and hit the big fucking head punt. One, two, three, that was the right, I think, result for this, especially even though they didn't know Edge was going to be hurt, but now he's going to be out. But I think... It was the right result because in a perfect world, they would have been able to contend, continue this program if they wanted to, but still Orton had to kind of be the guy to win since he's been active for the past 10 years and Edge hadn't. Um, but, you know, it could have gone either way. They could have, if, if they'd had a crowd, they should have gone with Edge getting the win uh, just for the big fucking pop and then let Randy get some heat after, but... There was nothing wrong with this match once you left it up to the fucking guys. It was only when they tried to dress it up with camera angles or sweeten the sound that it distracted and took away from what was solid top to bottom. These guys are just incredible. And they didn't make any fucking mistakes. And if they did make a slight misstep, they covered it up like fucking pros. I haven't seen anything top to bottom that... that just looked that good as far as actual pro wrestling in a long time, but the crowd sweetening and the fucking bullshit that they tried to do to it distracted from it, and they'd already had somebody come out and take a literal shit right in front of everybody right before they went in the fucking ring. So I would have been hot if I was Randy Orton or Edge at how uh, that my efforts were disrespected and fucking neutralized by the comedy crew and the fucking comedy writing crew. What did you think about the idea of marketing it as the greatest wrestling match ever before it even took place? Um, I wouldn't have done that because obviously, you know, and, and even Edge said it can't ever be the greatest match ever. Um, I wouldn't have, I would have found some way to, go in that direction without saying that it was going to be the greatest ever. But, but yes, the, and the point is that you could tell those guys took it seriously because they, they put together something that not only made sense all the way through, but also you could tell they were extra careful on the little things that a, a really brilliant worker would pay attention to edges, facial expressions when he's getting a shit kicked out of him and he's disoriented or they're in a hold and they're working the hold and the stance of the, not only the guy that's got the hold on, but the fucking body language of the guy that he's, that's in it. The, they, they made sure that there was no holes in their little things because they wanted to come through with as technically perfect and not perfect but just technically well done piece of business that anybody at, at least still living has seen us old folks that saw everybody may have you know may have seen some things better but but to market it that way it's almost it to me marketing is the greatest wrestling match of all time on purpose because it's these two guys that are great workers is almost like advertising this as the greatest match of all time is sort of like when the announcers popped on it at the beginning because it actually had rules. 
you're you're sort of in effect knocking all the other matches and or telling all the uh, telling people that all the other guys don't know what the fuck they're doing but these guys are real great workers it just there were for a hundred years the logic in wrestling was easy present it like it's real and don't let anybody know anything else if you can help it and that was pretty easy to follow but now that they've fucking told everybody that everything's bullshit except when we every once in a while we want you to believe something's real even though it's bullshit too but we'll go extra miles to make you think that it's real even though you're going to figure it out sooner or later that it's bullshit because we didn't close all the fucking loopholes because we can't think that well this the the whole work shoot thing is just it's fucking goofy so they're presenting matches now that stand out because there are actually rules in them and they're advertising that matches are going to be great because it's not these fucking new guys that we've fucking rushed up and don't know their basics and can't fucking perform properly. It's the veterans from the old days that know what they're doing. This is what they're telling people. I don't get it. But having said that, bravo, gentlemen. I, do you know if, is there... <clears throat> and I know that and AJ and Daniel Bryan, I'm sure was good. And Daniel Bryan's a great worker, but when you put AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan in the ring, you have a technical, excellent match that may be a step above at the gate, Billy Robinson and Tony Charles, where Eddie Graham would sit back there and say, it's a great match to have on the card for wrestling, but it ain't going to draw you any money. But you have Randy Orton, who's been a mega level star, and Edge, who's been a mega level star, and both of them look like grown men and look like big stars. I don't know that there's anybody. Uh, is there 10 guys in the business that could have had a match of that length, worked that well, especially at both Orton and Edge's age, and not fuck up something? I don't know that there's that many in the business these days that could have done that good for that long. So they should be commended. What'd you think? <laughs> well, I thought it was really good. Uh, similar to you. The crowd noise didn't bother me as much. I just got kind of used to that. The bad camera angles or the weird camera angles are the ones that are implausible at a few different points. The one from underneath where you see Edge's face. I get, You said it was a DDT. I didn't remember what it was. I guess it was a DDT. Well, I wrote, because I think they, I thought that they did something like that at the start of the match on a lockup, but I just, I had written something down and looked up and just saw a glimpse of it. And I said, maybe I was seeing things, but then they did it again where I think he was going for a DDT and you see Edge's face and it, it it's, it's not possible. Where's my note? Wait a minute. Hold on. Because I wrote, uh, next, oh, camera angle under DDT. Like if they'd have given the move, and then you see him give the move seconds later from another camera angle, they would have dropped on the cameraman. You're right. Then, there's that, no camera um, there. Yeah, yeah, that immediately is, uh, there's no reason for that. It looks stupid. Anybody could say, as soon as they see something like that, that looks stupid. That couldn't happen. We put in a, a fucking, a teleporting cameraman in there. I didn't like that. I think it's one of the best things I've ever seen with Randy Orton. I thought it was really, really good. I really, really liked it. Samoa Joe was great. The only thing yeah. I didn't like was Joe did it, and I think one of the other idiots on commentary did it. When Randy Orton, things kind of slowed down at the end, and he backed up to the corner like, oh, my God, he's going to that dark place. Yeah. He's going to that dark place. What? Shut up. Shut up. Going to that dark place. What dark no, place? He's, he's thinking he's just going to kick this motherfucker he's fighting in the face. Don't get overly dramatic. Yeah. But other than that, it was great. I mean, like you said, it sucks that it was after that complete comedy bullshit. They were going to do that, open up the show with that or something. Don't put it right before a really ultra serious grudge match. This match should have been the match they had at WrestleMania. Other than that brawl well, around the developmental well, yeah, center. That that's what I was going to say is I was really enjoy uh, looking forward to seeing a match in a ring with these guys because they did the fucking thing at WrestleMania and it just, no, it, it, but these guys are artists at what they do in the ring. And this was fucking great, but they try every, the company tries everything they can to diminish when guys are capable of doing something like this. This is a kind of match where if you have friends that aren't wrestling fans 
you would want to say, hey, watch this. Look at what these guys can do. And you'd be proud of something like that instead of this fucking football field nonsense or all this other shit that people will laugh at. And then you've just made people laugh at your fucking business. So, you know, this is the kind of thing you want non-wrestling fans to see where they go, wow, holy shit, bow, boom, boom, boom. These guys are fucking great. And it's fucking serious. And, but they go to all this work and on the same show. That's why Luthes didn't want to work with the girls, the midgets, or the bear. Because he was trying to be a legitimate world champion and, and give the business a good image. And so I think they ought to, from now on, anybody who wants to work hard and actually put their body at risk to give the business a good image and put in a great performance should stipulate they don't want to be on the same show with Street Profits and the fucking Viking Raiders. Just like the girls, the midgets, and the bear for Thez. Because it's embarrassing and a fucking disgrace. Unfortunately, with Bruce Pritchard being elevated to his new position, which just helps <laughs> Vince McMahon get his bullshit <laughs> concepts out there more, I think we're going to start seeing more of this, not less of this. Which is Hey, I got news for you. If Bruce Pritchard was behind that fucking tag team thing, he was elevated all right. He was high as fuck. If he was behind that fucking tag team thing, and they ought to, that's what they ought to start drug testing for. Don't test for the virus. Don't test for steroids. Test for hallucinogenics and your fucking creative staff. All right. Anyway, I'm, I'm done with this whole fucking, yeah. I, Randy Orton and edge. You deserve all the accommodate, the accommodations, all the accolades or the allocades of your Lex Luger in the world for putting on a tremendous match and the company that sponsored it and put it on the air deserves a lot of shame for doing everything they could to diminish it and make it look bad. And that's what I got to say about that. Is there any big show we got to watch in the next week or can I have some fucking time? Well, in the next week, no. I mean, I guess the only thing to bring up and I kind of think I know the answer is that AEW is doing their fighter fest over two weeks on their television show. Oh, that's, that's, that's misfortunate for them. So I don't know where you uh, Yeah. Where Isn't that where, didn't they have the fucking uh, video game guy have a match on last year's fighter fest and they threw each other in Legos? I think so. Or maybe that was yeah. two years ago. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll, no, they ain't been around two years. I'll skip that shit. Never, never mind. I'm, I'm good on fighter fest. If, if we can close on a positive note, I wish we could. I just got a message from Mark Carluzzo. Do you know if Jimmy has ever told the story about my dad's show where the gatekeeper for the cage match was narcoleptic? <laughs> it was Mark Bogey. And at some point during the match, Cornette is screaming, Dennis, where's the fucking gatekeeper? Oh, no, no, no. No, he, he's conflated the stories. Bogey had the key to the cage and had fallen asleep. No, he's <laughs> conflated the stories. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's two. To, he did have a narcoleptic uh, uh, key guy at a cage, but I was, that wasn't the one I was screaming at. Dennis not only had a narcoleptic key keeper for the cage, but he also one time he gave it to fucking Fat Gino, Fat Gino Moore, the purple bomber. And that's the time I was screaming because they had this cage match going on. And I can't remember who was in it, but the fucking baby face was going to be making a comeback and the heel somewhere or another wiped the referee out and another referee is needed. That's when Eddie Sharkey, the famous Eddie Sharkey, the trained the road warriors, broke all those Minnesota guys into business, shot up Vern Gagne's office for messing around with his girlfriend. Eddie Sharkey in a referee's shirt is going to go to the ring and get in the cage and take over refereeing and save the day. Well, we found out two things. Number one, we found out Eddie Sharkey without his glasses on is as blind as a fucking bat, blind as a fucking eyeless cave fish. When he went out to the fucking ring, all he can see is there's a cage around the ring. He couldn't tell which side the door was on. So he goes all the way around the ring trying to find the door. In front of the door is supposed to be the timekeeper. But Fat Gino Moore has had the key. He put it on the string around his fucking neck, right? He sits down and it's 
It's like the Monsignor Bonner High School or wherever some of these places Dennis used to run. He sits down in one of those plastic folding chairs. It collapses under his 400-plus pound fucking girth. He falls backward and hits the back of his head and knocks himself out. <laughs> so they drag Gino Moore, and also the building is 100 degrees, and it is jam-packed. It's a huge... You remember Dennis used to pack these places, like 1,500 people in these gyms. Yeah. So they drag Gino Moore out back to get some air so he can, like, he, they drag him down the aisleway like a piece of human cholesterol in this fucking artery. And they got him outside in the back in the air, so the fresh air, so that he can come around. Well, when Sharky's walking around the ring, finally he finds the door, but there's no fucking cage keeper, key keeper to the cage because they've drugged Gino Moore out. So, now he so I'm screaming, where's fucking Gino? Where's the fucking key? They have to run back out to the back and rip the fucking key off from around Gino's fucking neck, who still he's, looks like a fucking weeble who has fallen down. You can't tell him whether he's rolling or walking because he's, until he's flapping his arms, he's trying to get up. Anyway, they run the key back in, open the fucking door, and Sharky gets in a cage. They do the finish. And they had to vamp for like a minute and a half while we found... But that was not the night of the narcoleptic referee. That was the night of the overweight referee that knocked himself out when the chair collapsed underneath him. Well, not referee, gatekeeper, I guess. Or, or keykeeper. Oh, gatekeeper, keykeeper, whatever the case may be. Well, now I need to ask you about the narcoleptic gatekeeper. But He just nodded off a lot in the middle of shit. But Mark basically, I mean, he got the name wrong, but he has the exact same story here. The one part at the end here is funny. He goes, best part is... All the fans thought it was part of the show. So they just <laughs> left him there laying on the floor and didn't offer any assistance. <laughs> oh God. It was, it was, it was certainly as Dennis would say, I wonder what the poor people are doing these days. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mark, for brightening up our, with an old story from 30 years ago, brightening up our review of modern wrestling. I'm really I, you know, it was great watching Orton and Edge teach the kids how it's supposed to be done, but I would have traded it not to have seen what was perpetrated beforehand. And that's a shame. There's so many few good matches these days. When they do one, I'd like to be able to give it full throated endorsement. But overall, I'm disappointed and mad at myself that I watched the show because it was so fucking insulting and disgraceful and despicable a manner of to portray our profession in. Well, for next week's show, I guess if the Revival or MJF have a match, you'll review that. Yes. What else? I mean, I, you've been promising this Undertaker documentary for weeks. I don't know if you want to do that. Well, you know, now that the store is down and all I have to do is send out 400 figures, I may have a chance. Okay. But also, I, you know, as I said one time, I was talking to Miss Texas, Jackie Moore. Love her. Fine young lady. We were talking... It was the time that TNA was going to go to the UK for the very first time. And there was a big advance. You remember that first time they went over there, they, they drew their all time record crowd of the time yeah. they'd been in business. And we were talking about that and how big the, the advance was. And I said, Jackie, I said, did you ever think that we'd see a day where they fucked the wrestling business up so bad that we'd have to go all the way to Europe to draw a house? And she said, no, I didn't. I said, but I've got faith. And she said, oh, you think it's going to come back? I said, no, I think we're going to fuck the UK up too. And wouldn't you know who won the pony? That's exactly what happened. By the third time they went, they couldn't draw pussy on a fucking troop train. Anyway, I got faith that between now and next week's Jim Cornette experience that another one of these fucking shit weasels is going to do something incredibly stupid that we can make fun of. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to have fun being grumpy and making mockery of these assholes that we don't like. Because, it, it, you know, I, I don't know why that they don't have any problem making a joke out of the wrestling business. They say, well, everybody, we're just having fun. It's just all supposed to be fun and fun and silly. And nobody's supposed to take things seriously when we have fun. That's when they make fun of the wrestling business. But when I make fun of them... Well, it's serious as a fucking heart attack and goddamn prostate cancer. How dare you talk about me like that? How dare you not take me seriously? How dare you just want to be silly about me and just have fun about me? Fuck all of you. 
If you're going to fucking be a fucking ass in public and ass off about the wrestling business, I'm going to make fun of your asses. We're going to have fun doing it. Right? Right, Brian? Right. Right. <laughs> oh, no. The mothership. <laughs> the mothership. I'll just all our catchphrase. <laughs> Catch- no! We'll be back next week, ladies and gentlemen, with more catchphrases and fun and silliness and offending as many people as we possibly can because we don't give two French fried titty fucks. Until then, for Brian, I'm Jim. Harley's right over here in the corner. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.